Good morning, everyone, and greetings from Malaysia. Greetings from uh, for all of you who are dialing in from different parts of the world at different time zone. I do hope you are able to hear me clearly and also able to see the screen uh, clearly. So uh, today uh, we are gathered here uh, to listen to some interesting discussion on the National Ecotourism Plan and also the National Ecotourism Webinar that we have organized here. So I would like to welcome everyone, uh, distinguished guests, uh, ecotourism enthusiasts, uh, to this uh, ecotourism webinar. Although the webinar is being hosted uh, in Penang, Malaysia, but it is done uh, uh, telecast live in Facebook Live as well. And also for those who have signed up uh, to be here today, we had more than 200 people registered, but we have so far about 73 people who have who's already in the room. Uh, so it's truly a pleasure to see uh, so many passionate individuals gathered here today to discuss uh, and promote sustainable uh, tourism practices uh, in our country. Uh, ecotourism plays a crucial role in not only showcasing the uh, natural wonders of Malaysia, but also in uh, preserving and protecting our environment for future generations. So as we delve into uh, discussions shortly, and presentations today, uh, let us remember the importance of responsible travel and the impact it can have on our ecosystem, wildlife, and local communities. So today's event uh, is organized by the Malaysian Ecotourism Association and supported by uh, District College in Penang and also the Habitat Foundation. Please take note, this session is being recorded uh, we have muted all your microphone for now. Uh, we will uh, allow you to unmute or ask questions by raising hand uh, during the Q&A session. Uh, all the mics for the speakers today have been, uh, uh, is, we have set it as a co-host mode, meaning to say they are able to control the mic and speak anytime. If they want to respond or say anything at, at any point of the time. Um, again, uh, as the main organizer uh, on the Malaysian Ecotourism Association, um, for those of you who are not aware, uh, MEA or Malaysian Ecotourism Association is a non-profit organization uh, dedicated uh, to promoting and supporting the development of sustainable ecotourism practices uh, in Malaysia. Uh, it was formed in July 2007 uh, through the collective efforts of uh, various individuals and organizations involved in ecotourism in Malaysia. So the primary purpose uh, uh, is to provide a platform for collaboration, knowledge sharing, and also uh, advocacy uh, among industry stakeholders to uh, advance the growth of responsible and sustainable uh, ecotourism. As you can see uh, from the screen here, uh, these are our current uh, exco uh, uh, in the association. Okay, I am currently the president of. Uh, Malaysian Ecotourism Association, supported by our Deputy President, uh, Professor Dr. Amran Hamza, who will be actually delivering the, the main uh, address today, uh, shortly. And then we have Mr. Uh, Lee Chun Long, who is our Hon Secretary, and also the, the, Dr. Junaida Lee, our Honorary Treasurer. And then we also have a uh, very strong uh, uh, Executive uh, uh, Council members uh, who have been supporting in our mission to uh, promote sustainable tourism, biodiversity conservation, uh, community development, research and education, and also other advocacy and policy. And of course, most importantly, in trying to network and, and, and collaborate. So the Malaysian Ecotourism Plan 2016-2025 has been a significant framework for uh, promoting sustainable tourism practices and conservation effort uh, in the country uh, over the past decade. As this plan uh, approach its expiration, uh, it is essential for all stakeholders uh, to reflect on it in its achievement shortcoming and also to see how we can move forward. So this event today, the webinar today serves as an uh, excellent starting point for the conversation. So we have uh, panelists uh, representing different organizations uh, who will be here to share their thoughts we will have uh, 
uh, Professor Amran Amza, who is going to be, uh, who is quite well known as the, the main architect of the National Ecotourism Plan, uh, who will be speaking uh, after this shortly now uh, to see where do we move forward uh, with the plan that is expiring soon. And then we will immediately after that, we will have uh, uh, a panel discussion, which I will moderate uh, with speakers uh, coming uh, from Borneo, Sabah, Mr. Timothy Teo. Who, is, uh, who, uh, who has been well versed in ecotourism uh, in, in Sukau and in Sandakan. And then we have Ms. Justin Jay, uh, who's, who's the Executive Director of the Habitat Foundation and who have recently initiated the, the Sustainable Tourism Platform, which I'm sure she will, will be sharing. And then also we have uh, our, our, our most, one of the most established professor in tourism planning in USM, Professor Dr. Badruddin Muhammad, uh, who will be talking about uh, what is happening uh, in the northern part of Malaysia, uh, working closely uh, in the tourism master plan. Uh, and, and so he will share his thoughts on ecotourism. So once we have completed this panel session, then we will have a national speaker uh, who is a guest speaker uh, who will be speaking on the uh, bringing you a global perspective of the potential of ecotourism for sustainable de uh, development. This is Dr. Delphine Melred King, who is advisor for the long run in, in UK and currently based in Kenya. So she will be dialing in a bit shortly because of the of the time difference. So without further ado, I know we have a lot to discuss and we have short time. So I'm going to uh, allow uh, Professor Amran Hamza to take the floor. Prof. Hamza, uh, Prof. Amran, you are able to uh, unmute your mic and you uh, you can start your, your discussion for today. Prof. Amran, over to you. Thank you, Prof. Vic. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to all of you. Good morning, afternoon or evening, <clears throat> depending on wherever you are. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Prof. Prof. Vic and uh, I think the whole EXCO, MEA EXCO for organizing this webinar. And although we uh, we have almost fully recovered from COVID, and we all we would like to see people more face to face, uh, but this is also a good way of trying to bring uh, people together. And I've been asked to give a talk on what will be my reflections on the National Ecotourism Plan, 2016-2025, and I put here the title as. The end is nice. So what's next? Uh, it is not the end of the world yet, I hope, and we hope. But as uh, Prof. Vic said, this is, uh, we are approaching the end of the planning horizon for the National Ecotourism Plan. I think it's a very appropriate that we uh, take stock of what has happened or what has not happened uh, over the past uh, almost 10 years. So I'm going to share basically my own views. So uh, thank you for joining us. I would like to have a special welcome to Professor Bada. Uh, we have really missed you. So I think we have, I also look forward to listening to the next session, which is the panel discussion. So let's talk about this National Ecotourism Plan. I'm going to talk about uh, giving you a retrospective, uh, retrospective of the not only the National Ecotourism Plan 2016, but the original plan 1996. Just touch a bit on that. And then uh, I asked myself this question over the past few days. Where did we go wrong? Or was there anything that we can say that we also did something right? Uh, and then that leads us to this question, whether or not we need a, a, a National Ecotourism Plan for 2026. And usually it's a 10 year period or 15 year planning horizon and but before we can decide or before the authorities we have no power to demand this of course uh, whether we need a national plan is what lessons uh, are there to be learned from i call this national ecotourism plan 2 so and, and what the next or national ecotourism plan 3 nep should focus on so that will be, in a nutshell, what I'm going to talk about in the next uh, 20 minutes. And we can have a bit of discussion after that. So looking back, 
this is the really wonderful National Ecotourism Plan 1996. It was uh, done by WWF for the Ministry of Tourism. The name, they keep changing the names. I wouldn't know what whether it's more tech or more cat, but it is the Ministry of Tourism. Uh, the the beauty of this plan is that it's, it's, it was like a manual. You know, you have got guidelines for eco laws, guidelines for trails, and uh, because it is a plan as opposed to a policy, which, which is supposed, uh, the policy is supposed to give you the strategic direction. The plan goes into very detail and even giving guidelines on how do you develop eco laws is a wonderful uh, you know, uh, uh, content of the plan. So what happened was, unfortunately, there was a lack of buy-in from the government agencies, especially from the state governments and also the uh, industry, because Malaysia was still, I would say, uh, we just graduated into what is called a wider tourism circuit comprising, of course, uh, Singapore, Thailand, Indonesia. We were always at the fringe, but because of the success of the first uh, Visit Malaysia Year campaign in 1990, so we became a big player almost overnight, and the Ministry of Tourism then formulated the Tourism Industry Act 1992 to regulate the industry, uh, and now it is being reviewed uh, finally, after so many years, but because of the tourism was still new, and the both the concept, the definition, concept, principles, and practice of ecotourism was something new, and the, especially the private sector and also government agencies uh, didn't have a sound understanding of what is it all about. And I think that was just uh, unfortunate in terms of the timing, but otherwise the plan is fantastic and very comprehensive. Next, please. So many years later, or 10 years later, uh, I had the privilege and was very fortunate to, to be given, uh, to lead this, uh, to become the lead consultant for the formulation of the National Ecotourism Plan for the period 2016 uh, to 2025, which of course uh, went through this COVID you know, along the way uh, to almost three years of COVID. And uh, what we really did try to introduce was we wanted a, a participatory approach, meaning that we were carrying out very intensive and, and extensive engagements with all stakeholders, government officials, industry, uh, academia, local communities. And that was uh, a very comprehensive way of trying to get buy-in and also a sense of ownership. The second one is we were, we were trying to introduce a different approach in terms of planning for ecotourism because ecotourism does not have the economies of scale, you can't build, you know, uh, four or five star resorts, 400 rooms, 500 rooms. So we have to be dependent on the economies of scope, which means that you need to use uh, leverage more on collaboration, joint marketing, uh, you know, even for the construction or, of access roads, uh, we need to uh, collaborate. And this is where we then introduce the concept of the micro cluster. And in the plan, we uh, went through this um, uh, focus group discussion exercise and uh, managed to come up with 60 ecotourism clusters in all the states in Malaysia. This was not the list that came from us, but it was uh, using the focus group discussions, we managed to get the industry players, especially, and the government agencies to endorse them. So they was, they was, they, these clusters would become the, the, the uh, focus areas for the development of ecotourism. And then we can deep dive into those in this. It was supposed to be that was the, supposed to be the plan. And we also included three pilot ecotourism clusters 
one in uh, Taiping, Kuala Sepetang, in Matang in Pera. Taiping is my hometown, of course. I'm very biased towards Taiping. And then we have uh, Sabah, one cluster in Sabah, Kinabatangan, Sandakan, and one in Sarawak. So we wanted to show that you can actually implement the cluster approach uh, and then using the uh, pilot project as the examples. And something that really was totally ignored, I think, was we also suggested a, a toolkit, a toolkit for uh, state agencies, for the private sector to use, uh, for them to develop, for them to detail out the uh, clusters. And I don't think anyone has used this at all. So the National Ecotourism Plan is available online. So if you want to have a look, although it's towards the end. So that, that is what, in a nutshell, what we try to do uh, in the National Ecotourism Plan number two, I will say NEP2. Next, please. Let me delve a bit on the clusters because I think this is very important. That is something that I feel is a game changer. So if you want to have a simple definition, it is a critical mass of competitive, or it could be complementary, tourism products, including one or more major attractions in a concentrated geographical area. So I, I can go on, but uh, in the interest of time, I just uh, limit this to this definition. So next. So if you want to look at it conceptually, this is how a cluster should uh, uh, you know, be operationalized. So it is when there is something, when there is an attraction in a particular geographical area. So you would have resorts coming in the ecologies, what is called uh, coal location that would lead to uh, the clustering of accommodation, transportation, FMB, other services. And this is the clustering uh, process. You can have uh, the horizontal uh, clustering. You can have diagonal clustering. You can have a vertical uh, clustering. And what it means is that by clustering, then you can increase the economies of scale, but more importantly, the economies of scope because you have small players coming in. They need more collaboration. And you see how the cluster can should perform is uh, it should be, you know, the more collaboration, uh, pulling up the market, pulling up resources, having common strategies, tactics, even uh, sharing physical infrastructure. Uh, though this is conceptually what a micro cluster uh, uh, should try to aspire. Next. So you cannot have clusters without having networks. So this is also crucial. So you can have a network, meaning that within the cluster, you have uh, you can have a formal network. And this could be in the form of uh, protected area agencies, uh, national parks, agencies, custodians, or local authorities. And you can have even informal uh, clusters. For example, the Kuala Tahan Tourism Operator Association in, in Taman Negara, or you can have the Kita, Kinabatangan Corridor of Life, uh, tourism Operator Association, and uh, you can have the community-based Kunita in City Wetlands, Pawanis, Kopel in, uh, in Misowalai Homestay, and many more. So what the network should do is to have, of course, networking uh, for joint product development, self-help, joint promotion, and even to for conflict resolution and to resolve uh, any potential disputes. So conceptually, this is what the cluster uh, cluster should achieve next. I'm just giving you an example of um, an ecotourism micro cluster. This is a Sandakan Kinabatangan. If you uh, look at into look into the uh, the national ecotourism plan, you can see all the 61 uh, 60 clusters. So you have. In the cluster, a keystone attraction. Normally, the keystone attraction is the anchor or the most uh, attractive 
the attraction uh, within that destination, the cluster, for example, in the Sandakan, you have the Kinabatangan uh, Wildlife Sanctuary, where we have the Sepilo Rehabilitation Center, uh, uh, the uh, Keystones. And then you have supporting products. There are many, ranging from Labu Bay, Turtle Island, Sun Bear Conservation, and those Gomantong Cave in Kinabatangan. You have heritage attractions, you have culture, and you have the USP. You can map in all these, the tourist flows, and uh, from the clusters, you can use them as a basis for micro planning. So that is what a plan should try to achieve, as opposed to a policy, when I said from the beginning. Uh, so we have provided the basis for very detailed micro planning based on the clusters and the toolkit was supposed to help in the in trying to get all the stakeholders to sit down together and um, deep dive into every aspect. Next, please. But let me give my personal reality check on whether or not the NEP2, any clusters have uh, been successful or not. I would say that there is a very limited success in implementation. Uh, looking closely at the three pilot projects, pilot uh, clusters, uh, all of them did not really materialize except for from at the beginning, the Taiping, Batukurao, Matang, Kuala Sepetang, Bukit Merah cluster. There was hope when the Exco, Tourism Exco at that time, convened several meetings uh, uh, on site. I was there several times and there was uh, the appetite from the state government to try to implement this uh, wonderful uh, ecotourism cluster. But after several weeks of uh, discussion, and it just fizz fizzled out. And I think it got lost in translation when it went down to the government agency level without yeah, giving names. And certainly either it is uh, they certainly lost interest or there was maybe many people could not read maps. So, uh, and also the toolkit, because whenever I was asked to give, to give more uh, presentations on this, it was my fault too for not uh, really stressing on the need to develop the toolkit and use a toolkit for micro planning at the destination level. But even if we, if I must honestly confess that there was much success in implementation, they, uh, I was pleasantly surprised by the response from the Pahang state government. I think this was more a personality-driven response uh, in which um, uh, they or Dato Idros himself as a lead uh, used the clusters, you know, to develop detailed ecotourism plans for Pahang state government. And because Pahang is blessed with many ecotourism sites, ranging from, of course, Taman Negara to Kenong and many more. So possibly they saw the uh, value of using the clusters. And I'm so happy to see it, to know that they use that as a basis for their uh, state level planning. Unfortunately, there's a change in leadership, I think. Uh, uh, but that's a good uh, success story in uh, from Pahang. Next. But there are also intangible successes. I would think that <clears throat> the NEP2 provided the national context for planning and the development of ecotourism. I have seen many documents which, which starts by we start by saying that we are referring to the NEP uh, cluster, so and so. It did, so I think people are using it. Uh, there is um, uh, an attempt to connect it with the bigger, uh, you know, overarching strategies in the NEP. Um, the clusters have been widely cited, uh, and I believe that there has been uh, some kind of mindset change towards tourism concessions. I will go into this a bit later. Uh, we introduced also tourism concessions. There was, was very little um, uh, support for this from the conservation agencies, but then there was a change of heart 
and I think uh, Justin is here. The success of, of course, the Habitat Penang Hill uh, paved the way for, you know, a change of heart, change in mindset. And I think there's a better understanding of the, the dynamics and nuances of ecotourism. When the, during the period of uh, National Ecotourism Plan 1, when to talk about ecotourists, uh, many, especially the conservation fraternity, was said, ah, we will only allow ecotourists to come in, you know. And I always ask them, ecotourists do not wear hats, saying that I'm an ecotourist. So in NEP2, we try to change that. We say that there are uh, soft ecotourism, uh, hard ecotourism, there is eco-adventure. Uh, likewise, there are tourists who who might be considered as a mainstream tourist, but they enjoy also some kind of soft ecotourism. So how do you educate them? You know, so a lot of new ones. So ecotourism is not just, you know, people who like nature or uh, ecology, so to speak. Next. Please. So we have come to this juncture. I hope I still have time to go. I'm putting this question, should we formulate a national ecotourism plan 2026? We would call this NEP3, if there is appetite for this. And that is the cover, uh, and the content is still empty. So my personal view is that only if there is an appetite and willingness to do things differently. If we are just treating the plan as something that is to be, you know, put in the cupboard, then I don't think we should consider. But if we were to uh, go into this, then we will have to learn from the lessons of the current plan. And uh, we always say now that plan making, the plan making process is more important than the final documents. Yeah, I I'm, I agree. So the, the, it used to be that the document is supposed to be the final product and it ends up on the shelf. But now we are, uh, stressing that wow, what would be the, the benefits of going through all these processes is that we have a very uh, participatory approach and there's a buy-in, there is a sense of openness, you're fine. But if a plan gets stuck at the national level, it doesn't cascade down to the destination level, so it gets nowhere. So I would say that if you were to con consider uh, any an, uh, NEP3, we must try to include a process where the strategies and the policies in, that will be recommended could be cascaded down to the uh, destination level by the state agencies, by the local authorities, by other, uh, by the private sector, local communities, and so on. And that should be the spirit of NEP3. Let me explain this a bit more. Next. So what lessons can we learn from NEP2? I would break it down into the process. I think we were very successful. It was a very intense what we did in terms of the uh, consultations with the industry and all the all other stakeholders. And without those intensive uh, consultations, we would not have been able to develop the 60 ecotourism clusters. It was a lot of debate uh, whether Sabah uh, should have four or uh, six or seven. Uh, and then finally, there was a consensus that this would be the cluster that would be used for the next uh, 10 years. Um, I must admit that we fail to include in the stakeholder discussions, engagements, uh, the toolkits. The toolkit just came from us. So we developed the toolkit, the process that is supposed to take place once we you adapt, adopt or adapt the toolkit, but there was no, no discussions on how this should be developed. And because of that, I think the toolkit became ignored. And that was, um, uh, whether it is intentional or unintentional, the toolkit just became an appendix that was uh, not considered as crucial to the process. So if we were to go on uh, with uh, NEP3, I would like to suggest that it should be still a participatory process, but it should include also a toolkit and a toolkit should be developed with all by all stakeholders. And then 
you must also have uh, a series of workshops when the plan is ready uh, at the state level, at the local authority level. There should be workshops. How do we understand? How do you read the plan and how to use it? I think uh, that's our weakness. I've seen many cases, especially in um, uh, the, in Spain, whereby they have subsequent workshops for government agencies to understand the plan so that when they go back to their constituency, they can include the aspirations, the objectives, and they align it to the national planning. And that is never, very seldom done, the workshops to understand the plan. Next, please. And then it's a governance issue. We try to tackle that it cannot be a top-down uh, process that we include in this developing uh, ecotourism. It should have uh, uh, um, uh, changes in the transformative changes in terms of governance. Um, then the, for example, when we were doing this, the custodian of national parks, which belong to a conservation ministry, they keep changing their name. I think they changed their, their name uh, more, uh, maybe 10 times over the past five years. And they were not very supportive of ecotourism as a core business. If you look at the IUCN category two, many of our ecotourism sites are occurring in national parks. And in, in a national park, if you follow the IUCN definition, it should have a prominent e public enjoyment component, which means tourism. And this is always a kind of tourism that would uh, have a synergy, tries to achieve synergy between conservation and tourism. But there was a disconnect because agencies that were involved in managing national parks said that it's not our core business. We are not interested in uh, that is up to the Ministry of Tourism. And there was even a form of uh, hostility towards uh, the idea of a tourism concession. So we propose tourism concessions uh, and how do you do it? But there was very little buy-in. And then along the way, over the years, uh, since we the plan was uh, gazetted, uh, Habitat Penang Hill showed how uh, a concession could be done successfully. And Simca, the so good uh, islands in Sabah, now the first uh, island in Asia to be given IUCN green list. And they have shown that, you know, that um, uh, there could be success stories. And this uh, is paved the way for uh, a different kind of governance, which is a governance based on collaborative management, a governance that would uh, uh, really use the you know, savviness of the private sector in terms of uh, for giving tourism concessions and yet without compromising, you know, conservation uh, ideals in the development of ecotourism. So I think governance is a key issue we need to work on in the National Ecotourism Plan 3. Next. And still on the subject of collaborative management models. So you cannot be top down, uh, government knows all, we, uh, government knows best. So over the past few months, we can see that there's some uh, green shoots of these collaborative management models coming up. Uh, Pahang State Government uh, recently or several months ago established the Al Sultan Abdullah Royal Tiger Reserve and a few more uh, state parks will be is in, uh, are in the pipeline. And this is all using a collaborative management model. I don't have time to discuss this, but <clears throat> what it means is that now through these collaborative management models, you can use the savviness or the private sector, social enterprises, foundations, and they bring in uh, innovative, sustainable financing models uh, so that the protected areas, national parks could function uh, in a way that, you know, income from tourism can be plowed back into conservation, hence really uh, supporting the synergy between conservation and tourism. And it, was, it is also a good foundation for, you know, using iconic assets for non-consumptive wildlife tourism, which is part of uh, the ecotourism spectrum. Next. While still on the subject of sustainable financing, I feel that this is something lacking. 
uh, still in Malaysia, NEP2 attempted to open up income streams through ecotourism. Uh, I think we, no country in Southeast Asia can compare with Malaysia in terms of our ecotourism resources, but we don't get enough money from ecotourism. Sad, you know. Uh, if we know how to leverage on sustainable financing, so we should get uh, more money from ecotourism, local communities should gain more, and some of the income can be plowed back into uh, conservation efforts. And I think only Sabah parks have been successful in doing so. Uh, nowadays, if you don't have 500 ringgit, at least you can go up the, uh, the mountain, stay overnight. Uh, they raise the entrance fee every few years. There are a lot of complaints uh, for two weeks, and then people will still queue up to go up Mount Kinabalu. And uh, you compare what is happening still with our national parks. Uh, some are charging one ringgit, five ringgit, ten ringgit entrance fee. So uh, there's no way you can, you know, have sustainable financing if you don't even look at the uh, entrance fee to our wonderful national uh, ecotourism experiences offered by our national parks. Uh, I think in terms of the laws, they have been given clearance to to increase this entrance fee, but I think politicians will make a big noise. So again, NAP3 should really focus on uh, the sustainable financing next. Some more lessons, and I think I would like to revisit our ecotourism micro clusters. So I think in terms of uh, the clusters on paper, on the map, they are, I think, very well done because they involve all the inputs from the private sector, really dealing it. You know, uh, the cluster do not have a uniform geographical boundary. It, it all came from the inputs from all uh, experts and key stakeholders. And the keystone, Attraction is supposed to be the anchor for each uh, cluster. So if you have a look at any of the cluster, there will be always one or two keystone attractions. But keystone is more of a scientific word used by in the conservation fraternity, by the conservation fraternity. It's correct, scientifically correct, a keystone. But it's not sexy, you know, a keystone, what's a keystone? But uh, in tourism language, we would like to propose that instead of keystone, why don't we use natural phenomenon? So I don't want to go into all the wonderful national phenomena all over the world. Uh, you can Google them, but let's look at some of those that we can consider as being nat uh, natural uh, phenomenon. Next, national phenomena. Most for us, I would say is a natural phenomenon. I'm afraid uh, too many tourists have uh, what you call this caused a lot of impacts uh, on the moss forest in Cameron Highlands. Sky Mirror in Kuala Selangor, but again, uh, visitor management is a key issue. Blue Tears, Pulau Sembilan, Pera. The Pera government is trying to reduce the number of boats that can go to Pulau Sembilan. The uh, bats ox uh, exodus from Mulu, millions of bats in the late evening. Uh, again, it's a, a natural phenomenon. The Bena paddle ball, Sri Aman. Now you can even do surfing. I was there when it wasn't an, an, an made into an attraction yet. It's a really wonderful experience to see the Bena uh, paddle ball. And uh, a few weeks ago, ago, there was a lot of you know press uh, attention on the parting sea where you can walk at a certain time of the day from Pulau Giam to Pulau Panko. And, and, and I believe there are many more. And in terms of uh, being the main attraction of a cluster, they have potential, but we have to be very, very careful because rare natural phenomena have become iconic tourism attractions. But at the same time, because of that, they are facing serious visitor management challenges. So how do you reconcile this? Is NEP3. It's a challenge for NEP3. Next, please. And um, I've, I think in NEP2, we stress how important it is to use international designations 
as part of a branding. Of course, you, UNESCO World Heritage is the jewel in the ground. There are many more UNESCO men on biosphere reserve. Uh, lately, there's a lot of discussion about you know, Malaysia nominating cultural properties. I don't want to go into that discussion, leave it for another day. But I think uh, this is something that we need to stress that uh, UNESCO World Heritage is not about tourism at all. It is supposed to be about conserving uh, what we have in terms of the outstanding universal value that belongs to humanity. It's a global uh, wish to conserve these, but it has lots of economic spin-offs. And I must say that when uh, Kinabalu Park recently got a UNESCO Triple Crown, UNESCO World Heritage Site, uh, Man and Biosphere Reserve, and uh, many, maybe several months ago, UNESCO Geopark is only the third in the world. After, um, I think, is uh, the Korea Jeju Islands. And I'm not sure whether it's Xinjiang Bana in China. There. We are the third one. And I think we should um, uh, celebrate this more. Uh, but to their credit, I think Sabah Park is doing a wonderful job. But we must maximize the economic benefits, spin-offs. Huh? But of course, we shouldn't compromise the OUV. And Taman Negara has been there for almost 80 years. It deserves uh, world heritage. Royal Bloom, I think they are preparing the, the dossier. But there are the serial nomination that should be sensed uh, into the tentative list, or if they are already in the tentative list, they should be given a priority. The Danum Valley, Imbak Canyon, and Malia Basin, they've been trying to get this since 2013. And it's a shame that our fantastic natural properties are not being given priority, if there is any list at all from uh, Jabatan Warisan Negara. So I think NEP3 should make a strong case for that's uh, the designations of uh, our wonderful natural assets. Next, please. It is always in any plan related to ecotourism, of course, in the national ecotourism plan, there should be a concern about carrying capacity and visitor management. And I think I've seen many documents and even I'm involved with a few now that we keep using this term carrying capacity uh, in the hope of coming out with a magic number. People don't use this anymore. It's a futile exercise of coming out with magic number. So what? What do you do with it? And there are new uh, tools that are being used. Limits of acceptable change. Storm in Australia is very popular. Tourism optimization management uh, models, uh, visit uh, use management framework. Uh, IUCN uh, likes to do this. We have used uh, uh, v, uh, VUMF in a recent uh, the nature-based tourism plan for Alula in Saudi Arabia. Uh, they are all wonderful terms, but I get this question always. Uh, has there been any successful use of LAC or anywhere in the world? Of course, no, because they are not meant to provide uh, solutions. They are supposed to provide you with the tool that can be used to uh, develop uh, management strategies. And that is something missing from all the plans. And in NEP3 should always use the uh, principle that any form of carrying capacity tool should be used to uh, develop management strategy, strategies to minimize impacts. And uh, you cannot do this if you don't have adequate baseline data. And you cannot do this if there is no attempt to monitor uh, if there is no regular monitoring, but also more importantly, you cannot do this if you don't develop threshold limits. Uh, there's no time for me to go on on threshold limits. Uh, regardless of what tool you use, we have to be, the NEP should be very clear on how do you develop threshold limits. E, some people use it as a tipping points, for example, in reef checks, uh, annual monitoring, uh, reports on the state of our coral reefs. You can see that they are using tipping points. It's fine, uh, thanks to Julian's uh, team. I think they are producing some really relevant uh, benchmarking metrics, but we need to move towards the uh, threshold limits in any of these uh, uh, techniques. So I'm going to try to rush, rush the next few slides. Next, please. 
and we cannot run away from the fact that any ecotourism is very, very uh, dependent on the quality of the interpretation and storytelling. So you need quality, you need certified guides, and uh, our guides are wonderful. But I think we need to move on uh, towards uh, specialization, towards uh, advanced certification to in niche. Birding guides, I was told that they get paid three times more than the uh, generic nature guides, caving guides, adventure guides. So NEP should really focus on how do you uh, upscale the quality of guiding in Malaysia. There are many ways uh, through the interface with X1482, Tourism Industry X. It could be through the associations, ISO quality assurance. Malim Gunung also has a guiding, but they are mainly for, for safety reasons. For, so we need to focus a lot on this aspect in NEP3. Next, please. And then we talk about sustainability certification. Oh, there is a whole list to choose from GSTC, which is very aggressive now in uh, you know trying to get people to use this. Green Globe, Green Leaf, Green Key, Travel Life, Green Science for people forget that they are all very expensive. About 15 years ago, all these uh, eco labels came to Malaysia. Uh, they did like a show, uh, trade fair, uh, selling there. And then everybody realized that it was too expensive. Uh, you need 50,000, 100,000. And I think it's beyond most small scale ecotourism operators to apply to get certified. So NEP should try to work within the clusters and then develop certification for each cluster for all or for several clusters. Kaikura Whale Watch in New Zealand, uh, I think it's the first in the world whereby they certify the whole Kaikura township. It's a small township for uh, mainly Maori youth, but the whole town is certified. So you, you don't have to have an individual certification uh, operator. So what about, let's say the cluster of Kinabatangan. The Kinabatangan can be certified through KITA, through Majlis Daira, and of course the agencies, uh, this uh, collaboration for the whole Kinabatangan Corridor of Life. And the now they are going for UNESCO Man and Biosphere Reserve. Certification should be for the whole cluster. Next, please. Finally, we need to go smart. And I think we, by going smart, meaning is, uh, it means that we have to go uh, smart ecotourism destination. NEP3 should embrace digitalization. Uh, it's not only about e-marketing. It's about big data analytics. Uh, you using digital technologies, but you cannot just, you uh, know, uh, what do you call onboard. The term they use is onboard uh, attractions, ecotourism attractions into a smart system, uh, GPS, and and then. But it has to be complemented by capacity building. Those offering ecotourism uh, offering uh, services uh, have to be upskilled so that the smart rural ecotourism destination, uh, like what Dasta is doing in Thailand destination. Uh, they have this DMO called and, uh, DASTA, nine uh, DMOs, and they are, uh, they have been pushing for smart rural destination for the past five years, and we have not even uh, given, uh, you know, serious thought about this. So this is a key uh, addition, I would say, as a focus area in the NEP. Next. So as a conclusion, sorry, I've taken too long. And I think I must admit that NEP2 has also suffered the same fate as most of our documents, public documents, strategic plans. There are many of them, but we just lack implementation. And I think we have done well in terms of using a participatory process. And I think we have introduced a very, very uh, con difficult concept to understand, micro clusters. Uh, but again, the failure is how do you cascade it down to the state and local level. So if you ask me now at the end of my talk, the question whether we uh, should have a national ecotourism plan three 
as we approach the the end of the planning horizon, the end is nigh. How can we learn from its lessons? And I think the lessons that I've shared are adequate enough for us to plot a different pathway if you want to go on with the NEP3. Thank you very much for your patience. And I bring us back to Prof. Vicky. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Amran, for a really an excellent uh, presentation on where we are in terms of our uh, current national ecotourism plan and where we are heading uh, because as we know uh, Malaysia have always produced an excellent uh, uh, blueprint uh, but the, the challenge is always how do we execute this blueprint not just at the national level uh, even at the state level we, we have the same issue tourism master plan being developed at the state level and then you have a problem of actually executing this plan uh, and I think you have actually brought up very interesting uh, points where uh, uh, what are the things that we need to look forward in the in the third NEP if it really takes off? Uh, there's a lot of questions actually uh, in the in the chat, and and I know in the interest of time we, we may have a problem trying to address these questions. And uh, what I'm going to do is file these questions and and shoot this back to all our panelists, uh, including Prof Amran later, to see uh, if you can respond, and then we will actually send the response back to the to the to the participant. I've just got this one uh, question uh, for you, uh, Prof Amran, before we, we move to the next session. Uh, in terms of, uh, I know you focus a lot of your talk today on the microclustering and how have the microcluster uh, clusters proposed uh, in the plan uh, uh, fed and how, how, what do we need to do to change the approach in the microclustering so that the future, the NEP3, will succeed because there are some good things that has happened, but uh, but generally it has not really taken off well. And what we need to really look at, because for me, I find this microclustering is really uh, important and key uh, for the development of, uh, of ecotourism. So how what is the lesson we can learn from this microclustering that we need to uh, make the changes or, or, or some form of adaptation from the learnings to the future? Okay, thank you. That's a very good question indeed. And I said earlier, as I said earlier in the, my presentation, uh, for the clusters to be successful, you need to develop a network for each of the cluster and the networking that subsequently will take place. And uh, if we can identify who would be the lead agency or lead entity, and then the subsequent discussions that would need to be carried out in trying to detail out the clusters and to reduce any possible conflicts, uh, resolve uh, conflicts. And this is the, the role of the, the network. The only network that I've seen take away the government, you know, the role of government agencies, because if you post this to the government agency, they will say that we already have a majlis plancongan uh, daerah or district the tourism uh, office or committee or, you know, that is still a very top-down in nature and it doesn't really empower the industry, local communities. Huh? So it is doing something good, but I don't think it is really in the spirit of clusters. The only one that I've seen is potentially, but hasn't really fulfilled its potential is Kita, the Kinabatangan uh, cluster, the network in the Kinabatangan is supposed to be an uh, association that is representing all the uh, private sector, including local community operators. Uh, and... Uh, they are very linked to the Gammon agencies, Sabah Tourism, uh, of course, Tourism Board supporting them, and the Sabah Tourism, uh, sorry, Forestry Department, Sarawak Wildlife, very well associated. You also have some private sector oil palm plantations. Sawit Kinabalu already is uh, trying to also, you know, be involved in community based tourism. Uh, but the buy in and the level of, uh, <laughs> I'm afraid suspicion about the Kita within members is has to be resolved. It has a potential. It is a functioning uh, network, but 
there need to be more communication. There need to be more outreach so that to for for Kita to really explain what they are trying to do because they are also are trying to collect the conservation fee to be given back to the government. So I think there's a lot of potential for Kita, but without any kind of network, uh, none of the clusters can uh, succeed. So the government okay. should try to uh, the, uh, get the other stakeholders to lead the clusters. And of course, once you have the network and then the toolkit has to be used to detail out the clusters. Otherwise, the clusters that we identify are just at the, you know, the mi micro level. The details can only be done if you employ the toolkit, which I said uh, is in there in the plan, but it's not being used at all. I hope I answered your question. Okay, uh, Prof. Amran, just uh, I think there there are a few questions here in relation to agri tourism, agro tourism. Um, in terms of association of agro-tourism with ecotourism, because in your in the master plan, of course, we talk a lot about ecotourism. So I think the question here is, uh, I think this question is coming from Penang as well, uh, on agro-tourism destinations, uh, which is actually, if you look at in Balipula, rich with durians, nutmegs, and cloves. Uh, so is it a subset of ecotourism? And, and that's one part of the question. The other part of the question is uh, another, another question here in terms of, how is our ecotourism destination doing in terms of uh, uh, friendly towards uh, senior citizen and, and those who have physical limitation? Is Malaysia ready? Because you did mention we have the different models of ecotourism, soft, hard. So are we ready to attract uh, this kind of uh, tourists into our eco destination? So two part, agro-tourism and, uh, and those that are having a problem uh, in, in terms of getting into these natural sites because of their age and and physical uh, limitation. Thank you for very good questions. Uh, in the NEP one, I think the thinking then was ecotourism is, you know, very uh, limited uh, scope in terms of what they are offering. And but in NEP two, we try to open it, open it up, and we uh, we stress the fact that we cannot separate uh, nature and culture. So the clusters are all trying to combine nature and culture as part of the offering because they are intertwined. And this includes also when you look at how they are being branded as uh, tourism products. Uh, if it's ag agri-tourism, agro-tourism, uh, adventure tourism, they should be part of the clusters too. So you cannot separate them then because they are adding value to, uh, to the clusters. So I think, in, uh, especially now, post-COVID, when rural tourism, which also uh, encompasses uh, agri-tourism, is becoming the, the attraction. And, and along the way, you have scenic routes. And be, along the scenic routes, you have gastronomic uh, uh, delights, attractions. And they are all part of the ecotourism clusters. Food. So the second question is uh, on, where was it? Sorry. I... Uh, second question is on uh, access of ecotourism site for senior citizen and those who have okay. uh, limited, uh, physical ability. I think generally in terms of eco uh, sorry tourism development in Malaysia, we still have a long way to go in terms of accessible tourism, right? Despite all the very nice uh, uh, policy that we have. So if you go into details where ecotourism and we, if you go into the different types of ecotourism, soft, hard, and I think for soft ecotourism, there's some good uh, progress that we made in terms of providing facilities to encourage accessible tourism. But uh, for hard ecotourism, I think we there's a, still a long way to go. But when we did a recent uh, focus group discussion, whether Malaysia as a whole is ready to sell hard ecotourism, the consensus from the industry was that uh, the next few years, we still, the demand is still for soft ecotourism, hard ecotourism. Uh, if you look at Mulu National Park, for example, it gets about 23, 25,000 tourists a year. It's a shame because it's a world class. For me, it's for number one. I read Mulu as number one, maybe with Kinabalu Park. You know, but when we go to Mulu, we do the very soft, relatively soft. You go into the deer cave, uh, clear water, they're all easy. 
and then you go out and then came come back and to enjoy the best exodus. What about the you know the hard eco tourism, uh, the pinnacles that will take two days and wading through you know camping uh, and many more. Those are wonderful, fantastic hard eco tourism that we are not selling. The demand is there, but we don't. People don't know that you have hard even among domestic tourists. So when you talk about those hard eco tourism. Uh, there would be some people who need accessible tourism, and you have to include those. And I think NEP two uh, should pave. Uh, sorry, NEP three, if there is one, should pave the way for us to go into hard eco tourism. And this is you have to also combine it with uh, match it with the the pricing, so that Malaysia can be sold into a premier eco tourism destination. Sabah is the only state at the moment which has the potential of becoming a Premier ecotourism, selling soft, medium, eco adventure, and hard. But we are still selling Malaysia as, as an affordable, they say. Uh, it, it means cheap. Lah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Amran. Uh, thank you for the great presentation. I'm sorry for those who have still some questions here, which we are really behind time today. And we will. Uh, Get Prof. Amran to respond to some of this question and then we'll respond to you. We have your registration. We will contact you accordingly. Uh, so thank you once again, Prof. Amran. It's, yeah, it's always a pleasure to, to listen, to get your insight on where we are. Uh, so uh, we really do hope the NEB3 uh, uh, will be something that all of us can contribute and work towards. And as we move, uh, it's going to be slightly different. Post-COVID, things have changed. A lot of technology has come into play. So how do we find the balance to move uh, uh, the ecotourism industry is going to be important. So thank you, Prof. Amran. Uh, thank you once again. I hope you will stay on for our, our discussion uh, today. I'm glad that you are so confident that there will be an uh, NEP3 pick. Thanks, <laughs> everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so now we move on to the uh, second part of the session today, which is the uh, panel discussion. Um, so we have with us today uh, three panelists uh, who is going to speak on on different uh, scope of the uh, of the challenges that we are facing today. Uh, uh, the the Malaysia's ecotourism landscape, the challenges and opportunities for the future. Uh, we have heard from Prof Amran, and he has actually set the tone for for what is happening, what was the challenges, and where we are heading. And he did mention a lot uh, about Sabah. Uh, in the presentation today. So that is actually opening our doors today for our, our first panelist, uh, Mr. Timothy Tio, who is the uh, co-managing director of Bonio Eco Tours in Sabah, Malaysia. Uh, they have been doing excellent work uh, in Sabah and Sandakan, and uh, it's, it's great for us to have Timothy here. So Timothy, maybe uh, to start off the discussion today, uh, what, what I'm going to do, how I'm going to manage the session is I'm going to allow each of the panelists to speak about 10 to 15 minutes some discussion and 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 we'll take some questions uh, from the floor from the from our our viewers and and also from the participants here so let me first start with uh, uh, timothy maybe you want to you can share the screen i've given you the rights if you have a screen to share over to you timothy Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yes, fantastic. Okay. Thank you, uh, Professor Dr. Amran and also uh, Professor Vic for this opportunity to speak to uh, each and every one of you. It's really a pleasure. And uh, I must say that uh, Professor Amran summarized a lot of the challenges and the development of ecotourism over the years very nicely. Um, and it has been such a journey, three decades of ecotourism and um, and I remember that uh, this term ecotourism was coined uh, way back in Rio uh, in my father's generation. And uh, we've still been running with it today. So it has gone quite a long distance. Now, a bit about myself. My name is uh, Timothy Tio, and I'm the co-managing director of Bonio Eco Tours. Um, that we started in 1991. So it, it's also been a very long journey for Bonio Eco Tours. Um, and other than being a tour operator, we also run a number uh, two lodges. Suka Rainforest Lodge, Forest Lodge, uh, and a lot of uh, based uh, wildlife focused activities. And that's really our core specialty. Now, um, 
when we started in ecotourism, ecotourism was still in its very much infancy. And we've seen how ecotourism has changed over the years. And as many of you know today, that the whole area is a bit crowded. Talk of sustainability, carbon. So there are a lot of competing um, audiences, uh, competing interests for the same audience, people who value responsible travel. Um, and I could say that ecotourism is a subset of sustainable tourism. Um, and uh, it's so it's a question of what is the best interest for the markets that we are looking towards. Um, I think that's what we need to focus on. So I'll just jump straight into it. Now, I only have 15 minutes, so I'm going to proceed pretty quickly um, and stop myself after 15 minutes. So thank you very much. Now, for us, how we define ecotourism is basically um, responsible travel to natural areas that is conservation, the environment, sustains the well-being of the people and involves interpretation and education. So just very simply, I wanted to go down. And how Bonyo Ecotourist does it is we live by this triple bottom line kind of uh, value system. I'll explain a little bit more about it later. So first off, I guess most people know us for this one product, Sukha Rainforest Lodge. And it was built in 1995 as Eco Lodge, founded as an Eco Lodge. And it's right there in that part of Sava, okay? Um, about two and a half, two hours from Sandakan itself. So you can either go overland or by boat, okay? Just very quickly. And people come here really for the wildlife. It's because it is a wildlife sanctuary, number one, but just because it's also one of the best places in the whole world uh, after to see life in their natural habitat. And I cannot under, you cannot underestimate how where this quality is in the whole world. And that's why people travel from all around the world. And in fact, the biggest markets for us tend to be from Europe, from the UK, from the North America, and from Austro-Asia as well. So that's... So Sugar Rainforest Lodge, uh, we started in 1995. At the moment, we have 40 rooms, 20 deluxe and 20 villas. Um, and as of last year, we were upgraded into a four-star hotel. And I think if I'm not mistaken, we are probably lodge that was upgraded into a hotel, which tells us that the, the mindset of the government and the bodies are changing. Because what was once unthinkable where a lodge that does not have a TV could be a hotel is now a four-star uh, hotel. Okay, And we were also one of the founding members of National Geographic uh, Unique Lodges of the World, one of the 50 lodges around the whole world basically recognized for being of a unique quality. So it's not about luxury. It's not about price. Um, it's about a unique quality that is rare in the whole world. Okay. And of course, we've won many awards. I'll just show you a couple of them. Um, so a lot of international awards. We tend to like to go for international awards because that's really our core audience that we go for. Now, um, th so this is me in uh, Washington, D.C. at the National Geographic Society a couple of years back before COVID. Um, now, people always think that ecotourism is not perfect. And let me tell you, actually, ecotourism is not a statement of fact. It's a statement of in intent. It's about what is it you want to do at your company or as a person or an organization. It's not about where you are today. Take, for example, our small beginnings here. Uh, we were running on the solar panel sometimes and gen set sometimes. Um, there was no uh, proper sewage treatment, just septic systems, but very simple. And this shows you how ecotourism has changed. In 1995, this was the core market. They wanted bare bones. They wanted simple, very basic. Uh, they were happy to wrap it up. But over the 30 years of time, people change and the society has changed. So the core market that used to love this sort of Spartan approach now wanted something more, something that... that spoke of, you know, a service quality, excellence, going to be the best. And so over the years, we have evolved. So I do believe that, uh, especially as we are redoing a lot of the ecotourism uh, master plans, it's important to recognize that the market has changed. People's concept and idea of ecotourism has changed along with it and expectations as well. Um, and so we, we have to move along with that expectations. Now, the small beginnings, we started with uh, buying a small piece of land and uh, it was based off a concept that the true way to help economic development and st social stability 
really about jobs. At the end of the day, employment, when you employ people there, you have a chance to train them, to change mindsets, to transform the communities. So these are some of the things that can only be done when you actually plant yourself in the community and year in, year out, month in, month out, do the hard work that's required. Okay, And of course, over the 28 years, we've been able to slowly transform the community, the lodge, uh, even our own, so what eco to all about. So that's the features of our lodge. Show you quickly the restaurant, dining areas. So you can see that it's about being in a environment, but yet enjoying some of the comforts in a set in a way that conserves the environment at the same time. So while there are trade-offs that you make, you can all optimize find ways or solutions that minimizes the impact to the environment. And of course, over the years, we've also been recognized like Sir David Attenborough, who has come many times um, to Sukarmi Forest Lodge. And they come, people come for the River Wildlife Safari. So for my fellow uh, Malaysians who have never been to Sukau, and it's here you get to actually enjoy the wildlife in their natural habitat. So unlike in Africa, where they go on jeeps, here in uh, Sabah, we go by riverboats, okay? So, and uh, basically the idea is by operating an eco lodge, we want to teach people, show people what sustainability, what eco, living eco-friendly is all about through the actions uh, that we do. Are we perfect? Definitely no. I mean, there's nothing perfect in the world, but definitely for us, we are, tend to be very self-critical. We could have done this better. Why are we not doing that? And it's just a steady journey of improvement over time. Okay, so these are just some of the uh, characteristics of an eco lodge. I won't go dwell on it, but uh, you can uh, for it and by a person called Hitesh Mehta, who uh, who coined the term eco lodge. Okay, just some of the things that we adhere to uh, in terms of design, lighting, water usage, noise minimizations, the way we conduct the tours, making sure they are not disruptive to the local wildlife and the environment, and also making sure we incorporate benefits to the community, whether it's through shared value of purchasing their products, local employment, buying them. So there are many ways and there is no one size fits all. You have to tailor it to your community and to your environment. Okay, so um, a second lodge that we've started the end of last year is this place called Tabing Rainforest Lodge. Um, so this is another place uh, in they're called the Ekapu Forest Reserve, okay? And so the idea is that when you find a model that works, you can actually replicate the model over and over again, okay? Um, so just some of the rooms that we have there, some of the wildlife, and uh, that one, okay? I won't go through the video because I don't have much time, but I do want to talk about this uh, because we're talking about ecotourism, and it perhaps it's of value to other practitioners as well. We found that as a profit company, Sometimes balancing profit and impact, social impact is very difficult. And many years ago, my father made a decision to actually not be of dual minded, but to separate out that each organization should have a non-profit organization and a profit driven organization so that one is profit driven, but one is impact driven. Okay. So it's about having as much impact as we can. Okay, so we use this triple bottom line of people, planet, profit, in order to drive everything that we do. And how do we raise money? Well, basically, we raise it internally, first off. And because other organizations see that we put our money where our mouth is, they also want to co-contribute with us. And so because of that, we have a lot of partners, people like Konoko Phillips, Shell, CIB Foundation, Saba Society, um, Rotary Clubs. And that sort of thing. And so it's important when you have funds, when you have money, then only the real work can begin. So early on, we started with simple things like doing medical camps, outreach programs, okay, in the interior communities. We did a lot of volunteerism, uh, hoping for a lot of cultural exchanges between the local people and people of foreign cultures. Okay, we, we did a lot of tree planting over the years. So you can see that the style and the type of projects we do is not a one-stop shop. We actually have to keep changing, keep innovating in order, to, uh, in order to keep up with what is it the customer wants, what is it the impact we can have. 
Okay, so this is here us partnering with other longhouse up in the northern part of Kuda. So all across Sabah and anywhere in Malaysia, you can actually do ecotourism. So it's just about meeting the need in the community that you're in, right? So whether it is in the uh, Orang Asli community, community or whether it's about conserving a small slice of rainforest, there is a lot of work to be done, okay? And so we do a lot of relief restoration in the past. Timothy, are you there still? I think you are disconnected with Timothy. Timothy. Prof. Bada, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you well. Okay, so it means it's Timothy who is disconnected. Okay, let me try it. Timothy, are you okay? You have been disconnected. Uh, you can un can unmute yourself. Okay. I've already unmuted you. No. Oh. Okay. Hmm. Okay. We hear you now. Can you unmute yourself, uh, Timothy? Okay, I can now. I previously okay. I could not. Yeah, thank okay. you. Now, I think I've, I kind of ran up close to running out of time. Um, so I just will wrap up very quickly uh, with the last bit that I want to talk about, which was the community project that we... Okay. And I think it's important to say that uh, doing ecotourism is always a challenge and uh, it requires people believe in it so such as each one of you to go into your communities and be the players and change makers that you want um and i think with this project that we did a couple of years eight years ago we decided in two, two years ago to hand this project back to the community of kulu which means that basically surrendering whatever asset we had back to the community itself 
And uh, because of uh, the work that we were doing, we were recently recognized uh, last a few days ago uh, in the Philippines for this uh, Luck Bay Bukit Award. Um, and I think that each person can actually do this project and uh, really make a change in their communities. So I'll hand the time back to Vic, Professor Vic. Okay, thank, thank you, uh, Timothy, uh, for sharing us uh, the, the work, the good work that you are doing uh, uh, in uh, Tabah and uh, in, in Sukau. I think that that's uh, one of the things that we always talk about whenever we talk about Sabah. I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to save this for our discussion uh, towards the end. So I want to move on uh, to our second uh, uh, panelist today, uh, Ms. Justin J. West, uh, the Executive Director of the Habitat Foundation, which also uh, Prof. Amran mentioned today on the good work that you are doing over there. So Justin, so I'm going to pass the session to you. You can do a quick intro about yourself and then and, and start your discussion. Over to you, Justin. Hi, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me all right? Yes, good. Okay. Thank you. So it, this, it's been tremendous, actually. The discussions today have been really short and to the point. Um, just as a fun fact, uh, Timothy, my career in conservation started in Kinabatanga. And I think, I don't know anyone knows, but my very first job out of university was to write the Kinabatanga floodplain guidebook, right? When it, it was 96, I think. Tourism was in its infancy now. Um, I think the, the blurb for this particular event was, uh, you know, what was the impact of COVID? On, on all of us and how we're changing the way that we think. And uh, one of the key things was uh, because we were stranded in our houses, we decided to have a webinar and then we invited Prof Amran uh, to give a talk about the ecotourism plan, which was kind of not getting it the visibility that it needed. Um, but if, as a result of that, uh, as people started to contact me and say, hey, can we do something, right, uh, in the sector? And that was the beginning of what became the Sustainable Tourism uh, Malaysia Network. So I'm just going to give you some slides uh, to talk about that. Um, let me just get some, get the screens up just one minute. Okay. Let's go back to the beginning. Sorry, that's not the right one. Oh, sorry, this is not the right one either. Hang on. Uh, stop sharing. Okay, so um, whilst whilst waiting for me to get organized, um, so my job is at the Habitat Foundation, um, which is a non-profit, a sister organization of the Habitat Penang Hill, which Prof. Amran uh, mentioned earlier. Almost there. Okay, are you seeing my slides? Ken? All right. Yes. Okay, cool. All right, so um, so uh, what's really interesting is similar to uh, Sukau and Borneo Ecotours, the habitat has a, a functioning component, right? We have a commercial park showcasing a gateway to the Penang Hill uh, Biosphere Reserve, which we had a hand in actually developing. The foundation is set up as a completely different trust uh, and it's fully nonprofit, uh, but and we spend our time uh, uh, establishing and strengthening sustain, uh, sustainable tourism. Why in why is the question right? And I think one of the reasons why we decided to have a sustainable tourism webinar way back when was because many conservation organizations uh, have a kind of a foundational support from tourism, right? It's the tourism to conservation sites and natural areas that provides the basis for a lot of the community support and the earnings and funds that actually help to sustain conservation activities. Uh, at that time, we were very involved in the Society for Conservation Biology and uh, everybody was affected when tourism was affected. And so it was a really uh, stark, uh, description of how we, how closely interlinked we are, but also because when tourism is done well, it does support conservation. So our partners in the Sustainable Tourism Malaysia are Batu Batu Resort in uh, the Mersing Islands in Johor, who also fund separately another NGO, Tenga Island Conservation. And so together we are the co-chairs of Sustainable Tourism Malaysia. A word about the ripple and something about, uh, I love what Timothy said about intention Right, people. A lot of people get really intimidated by the idea of certification and claiming that you are ecotourism and all that, as if you'd achieve some wonderful 
uh, thing, right? Before you can be part of this very elite community. But I think the thing that in, in that is unites us at whichever stage in the game, whether you're a four-star resort or you're a community-based concern with mom and pop run and lodge is intention. And so the ripple, which is what our logo is, is the ripple is about uh, the decision of the consumer provider in terms of doing things differently and in a particular way. It also is about the consumer the ripple decision that comes when you choose to travel differently. And so we, we use this idea that we are imperfectly starting, right? We, we don't have it all together, but that intention and the imperfectly starting is what unites us. Uh, so we are connecting the conscious travel community and the community meaning the people that are providing tourism and the people that are partaking of it. Uh, so here's a little bit of a shout out to uh, the main drivers of the Malaysia network, uh, Batu Batu Resort, Tengah Island, uh, and of course the Habitat. I love this picture because everyone loves to zone in on our Curtis Crest, but check out this forest, isn't that beautiful, right? We're so fortunate to be able to be part of it. And as we have been part, uh, as we started to grow post COVID, we began to bring into our circle all of the different types of people that uh, are involved in tourism, right? So all up and down the country, we are by no means exhaustive now, we're continuing to grow, but the belief is that we, uh, you know, there is, an, there is this, this uh, resonance with this idea, okay, let's just start. And as we start and we celebrate each other's wins, congratulations to, to uh, Big Borneo Eco Tours for the recognition for their curated work. It's so impressive. And we know very much how difficult that is to achieve. And so, uh, in fact, all of this needs to go on to what we now uh, have developed and launched last year as the Sustainable Tourism.my platform. Uh, in the front of this particular slide is Dr. Delphine Malarek King of The Long Run, whose ideas we've adopted because they're so usable. They are so easy to understand. So the aim of the Sustainable Tourism uh, Network is to strengthen, I mean, we, we're supporting global best practices and familiarity with them. We believe in ground up initiatives and inclusive, like everyone with an intention deserves to be supported. Uh, our aim is to improve livelihoods and transform connections between people and planet and with co local culture and na nature in mind. Um, so the thing that which is very, very clear to us is that it's not that we don't have sustainable tourism offerings, it's just that we're not very good at promoting them and curating them and making them easily accessible to those who are starting to change the way they think about how they want to travel in Malaysia. So our first thing, a quick win for us is to make sure that we've captured uh, the breadth of what's available and highlight, even if they've got, you know, they've not got everything figured out, let's highlight the one or two things that they're doing exceptionally well to be part of this conversation, right? So we are in the process, it's an ongoing journey to showcase on our website, all of the different offerings and to bring uh, into our network and our training and capacity building meetings and opportunities, uh, the, you know, both sides, uh, as well as um, Malaysian Borneo and Peninsula. Uh, now, so it's, this is a nice opportunity because it it's also allows those people who have uh, spent a lot of time trying to figure out all the very kinds of technical things like sewage management. How do you do it on an island or a coastal area cheaply and efficiently? How do you change attitudes among your workers as well as your visitors to do things differently? Everybody has, has had a learning journey. And so through these uh, network meetings, you have the opportunity to meet other tourism businesses on how they are doing it. Um, so this is just a uh, site. Um, it's really worthwhile visiting the long run. Uh, Sher from Batu Batu Resort is a member and she really has used this as a guiding point on how that resort is developed. Um, and so we also have adopted uh, the long run four C's, conservation, culture, community and commerce, uh, because they are really a guiding point from on sustainability. And the one very significant thing is the idea of commerce, right? I think Prof Amran has alluded to the fact that we are undercharging for a lot of our amazing experiences, you know, and we think that we're doing people a favor. Someone once said to me that, well, wow, it's so cheap to go to the national park, then it, it can't be very good. This is actually what people tend to understand. They believe that something that's precious and beautiful and rare 
is something worth paying for. And so we have to transition into that uh, in order to be able to safeguard and build world-class destinations. Um, the habitat on Penang Hill does charge for its uh, access to the park. Um, and we are able, uh, and this is why it's actually caused a ripple, even though we are about 17 acres in size, we are able to be cash positive and hire up to 40 to 50 full-time staff. So we can push the model that we are generating jobs and becoming an economic driver for, for Penang uh, Island. Okay, so here's a little bit of a shout out to uh, a little bit to how um, in this short time we've managed to get the recognition from the government uh, and we are being supported to initiate an uh, initiative which is sector led, which is going to allow us to demonstrate sustainable tourism best practices in a number of landscapes that we've already been active. Um, here are five components. Uh, it was announced in the national budget for 2024. So we are actively rolling out initiatives uh, for building the network, doing reef to rainforest, uh, tourism better, cave and karst areas, all your geoparks, uh, historical landscapes and ecotourism clusters and urban forest. So this is what we'll be busy doing and communicating via our website. So I don't want to spend too much time. I do hope that you will look uh, at our website Look at this beautiful place. This is Taralamas Canyon in Ranau District, Sabah, where we have been working to strengthen capacity among indigenous communities there. Um, and also trying to educate and, and, and excite the new breed of traveler in Malaysia, which I do believe uh, is really been strengthened by the digital age uh, to become a little bit more conscious about how they spend, where they spend and how that can be transformative. Um, yeah, so we are in the business of collecting stories. And so any of you who have writers that we could actually contribute to these things, we will translate that. This is a dual language website in Bahasa and um, English and is entirely funded by the Habitat Foundation at the moment. Um, yeah, and then helpful guides, right? How to travel better, how to do your work better, uh, how we all can raise the game a little bit better. Um, so it's it's... It's very much grassroots driven and business driven. Um, and it makes me think about uh, the question about the, the new national ecotourism plan. I think that, uh, you know, we really need to create something which uh, empowers action and where it felt the most, right? So uh, something to think about. Uh, complicated things like the global sustainable tourism criteria and standards, uh, they are, Comprehensive, I mean, no one can argue with them. It's just that they're very dry and they're very intimidating. And so one of the jobs that we've taken upon ourselves is using video as well as real life examples to say, here is an example in Malaysia where we have fulfilled a specific standard in the GSTC. So this is how one can utilize the resources without having to pay uh, 50,000 ringgit. Um, I love the idea of doing, uh, you know, like like looking at uh, certifying whole areas. If we could do a national initiative, that's well worth it and less prohibitive. So I'm going to stop here. Hopefully we have more time for discussion uh, with a beautiful shot from a youth project in Tanjung Kupang, Johor. Yeah. All right. So I'm stopping to share now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Justin, uh, for, for the amazing work that the Habitat Foundation is actually doing uh, across uh, I've, yeah. I've just met Justin not too long ago and uh, it's been an interesting yeah. uh, to yeah, see. Yeah, because Prasnik is just up the road so we can meet over banana leaf usually. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. So All we right. hope to work more uh, after mm -hmm. this. Uh, right. So let's uh, let's go on with our next panelist, uh, Professor Dr. Badaruddin Mohamad, uh, uh, who is uh, who's not a new face, uh, uh, who is back uh, on track uh, uh, to work closely with us to see where we can how we can move forward in the ecotourism agenda uh, not just for the northern uh, peninsula but also uh, across the country uh, with with his expertise in, in tourism planning so over to you prof badarudin bismillahirrahmanirrahim uh, uh, assalamu alaikum uh, warahmatullahi wabarakatuh ladies and gentlemen uh, very good morning uh, i hope you can hear me well Yes, yes, we can. Okay, uh, I've been given uh, about five minutes, oh no, 15 minutes uh, to speak. Let me set my uh, my clock running. Uh, thank you, first of all, to uh, Professor Vicky, 
uh, and the edu edu um, ecotourism association for the kind invitation i would like to uh, note uh, special thanks to uh, my colleague my long time friend professor amran for a very uh, comprehensive and honest review of uh, the uh, ecotourism plan i would like to also uh, take note of uh, timothy of uh, Sukau experience and suggestion uh, from the Habitat uh, Foundation. I've been to Habitat many times and uh, it was a wonderful experience. And what uh, Timothy and Justin uh, show that uh, ecotourism, you know, does uh, work and can be uh, sustainable and profitable at the same time. Some of the keywords that I gather from uh, Prof. Amran uh, presentation was, uh, you know, you talk about cascading down uh, the, the whole idea of the plan to the uh, to, to, to the ground. He talked about governance. He talked about the sustainable financing. Uh, he talked about uh, what else? Uh, uh, carrying capacity and, and many more. And it's, it's always difficult for me to to speak, uh, you know, as the last speaker uh, in, in this section. But allow me to perhaps, uh, uh, you know, echo what uh, the previous uh, three speakers have uh, spoken uh, this morning uh, we've taking uh, by taking some examples of what's going on uh, in the northern peninsula malaysia especially in penang uh, especially in the post covid-19 uh, in line with the uh, conference uh, uh, what do you call theme well ladies and gentlemen boys and girls that uh, uh, covid-19 supposed to be a reset a reset for all of us and we all know it, uh, and all intervention, uh, intervention to the global tourism. I mean, everybody was stopped, everything was stopped. Uh, then uh, a reset, especially after the destruction caused by mass tourism and overall tourism. And the under-tourism phenomenon that we experienced uh, during COVID-19 uh, have made calls for quality tourism and responsible tourism louder uh, than, than ever before. So one of the lessons perhaps that uh, we want to ponder or discuss or bring forward, uh, you know, coming from the experience of COVID-19 is that we talk about perhaps to bring back the, 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 the issue of or the element of the notion of quality tourism, perhaps the way to go. Uh, well, quality tourism stems from uh, quality destination management like you see in Habitat and also in Sukau and attracting what we call as quality tourists. Well, Robert, that's, sorry, Robert, that's yeah. to stop. Are you are you sharing a screen? We don't see a screen. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, 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 okay. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. So I am sharing the screen. Thank you, Vic. Can you see it now? Okay, yes. Okay, thank you for the intervention. Uh, is it okay? All right, good. All right, sorry. The textbook definition of quality tourism are, you know, uh, tourists are tourists who respect the environment and local culture. They behave and also responsible. Uh, you know, for ecotourism purposes, they visit nature-based attractions to uh, appreciate nature. But uh, some of us, especially the state government, the ministry, often define quality tourists as those who spend uh, a lot of money when they travel. So this is where the, the, the contra contradiction uh, you know, arises, and this is where I'm uh, going into. Lesson number two, uh, Prof. Amran mentioned about the issue of carrying capacity, uh, limits of sustainable, uh, acceptable change, and so on. Uh, COVID-19 you know, taught us to perhaps to learn to respect the carrying capacity. Uh, well, it's easy for, for us to set uh, carrying capacity for you know specific uh, you know places like restaurants, hotels, and, and so on, but it's going to be a big challenge uh, for us to to respect or measure the carrying capacity for a nature based attractions, like for example in the case of of Dayang Bunting Lake in Langkawi, uh, where you know after COVID nineteen, uh, you know Langkawi and every islands in the country are striving to re attract you know, as many tourists as possible uh, to make up for the lost uh, number of figures 
in the in the previous years. So uh, if if you see, you know, right after COVID nineteen or during the opening within COVID nineteen, uh, boats were filled uh, to the limit, and uh, you know, Dayang Bunte, for example, have become uh, just another picnic spot, uh, another public swimming pool, and it seems like everybody just going back uh, to the old uh, same old thing. And for those who are familiar with Langkawi, which is uh, you know struggling at the moment. Uh, one of the uh, popular or key attraction of uh, you know Kilim area, Dayam Bunting area, uh, is is the uh, uh, eager feeding. So uh, you know during the COVID nineteen, uh, the eagles who were so over dependent on on tourists uh, to feed them had lost their uh, survival skill. And talking to Lada, you know, they they, they took the uh, the effort, uh, asking the operators to change the food uh, to a special fish that uh, you know uh, floats uh, on on water surface. So one of the lessons learned is that when you you are so over dependent on tourism, this is what happened. Uh, the birds were suffering uh, with uh, overcrowdedness uh, before COVID nineteen, and they will suffer again when there were no tourists coming uh, and and feed them. Lesson number four, perhaps uh, this is uh, echoed by, I think the three speakers, it's called for reassessment of the nature and its value. I think some examples like uh, Kinabalu, Sukau, uh, Habitat have shown that, you know, uh, people are willing to pay uh, and, and sometimes we have been selling our nature too cheaply or sometimes for free. Uh, I would like to take, for example, that, uh, you know, in the case of Penang, National Park, which is uh, claimed to be uh, the, the world's smallest forest reserve, uh, the closest national park uh, to an urban area, which is just down. Uh, but then, uh, you know, in the beginning, when it was announced as Penang National Park, uh, they were, uh, you know, nicely managed by Pahilitan. But then, I, I think this Penang National Park uh, was a subject was a very sad case of a tussle between uh, you know federal and the state government when at that time uh, you know uh, Penang was uh, uh, as a opposition state uh, led by Barisan National so eventually uh, this national park uh, become uh, no man's or no woman's land uh, nobody really uh, you know fund or uh, take care of this uh, national park and uh, if, uh, from my study, my team study that you know, tourists were willing to pay between five to ten ringgit uh, to enter and enjoy this uh, national park. But unfortunately, uh, like the previous speaker said, you know, how can you survive if you you know uh, pay a nominum of two ringgit, three ringgit, and to manage uh, the, the whole park? So uh, again, eh, sometimes when you uh, sell it, or open it too cheaply or for free, uh, this is just another recipe for a discussion. At the same time, uh, we are also experiencing changing tourist, uh, tourist demography. Uh, on one extreme, we have uh, golden age tourists who are very nostalgic, who are very, you know, uh, my way, who are slow paced and uh, appreciate nature and heritage. But uh, there, is, there is also a growing number of younger, smarter, sensitive, more demanding, adventurous, Comfort travelers, what I refer as the future tourists, the 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 the, the new generation, uh, that go for everything trending and and viral, that refer to, uh, you know, social media, TikTok as their reference, and not Ministry of Tourism, and not Sabah uh, Park or, or, or so on. You know, when 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 they travel, they will go to TikTok and see what other fellow. Uh, friends, you know, went through and, and, and so on. So this is the kind of uh, a growing niche market that we are, uh, you know, facing now that need to, uh, to take care of. Uh, this niche market want adventure. They want to be in the eco setting without getting hands, uh, their hands dirty. These are the future tourists. Uh, they just, uh, you know, people are looking for, instead of education, instead of heritage, instead of uh, conservation, uh, many people are looking for status, about showing off. Uh, I was there and I did that. And then uh, 
So this call for uh, places of attractions to be highly accessible with modern amenities, uh, attracting what uh, you know, block, uh, Stanley Block call as mass psychocentric. Uh, then uh, they visit these places mainly for content purposes, not really for appreciation uh, for, uh, purposes. And again, uh, main sources of information is TikTok, Google, and review. So um, perhaps uh, you know this is this is a picture, uh, Justin. That my team when we when we did the uh, Penang Tourism Master Plan uh, use, or I used to have this as my my background. We we use drone to take this picture. I can share you the the original uh, picture of this. Uh, in the case of of Penang tourism, uh, again, you know, uh, riding on the eco tourism boat. Uh, Penang also uh, bring uh, ecotourism site into the uh, tourism master plan, but with a different model. You know, I, I saw there was a question about uh, Balik Pulau uh, coming in as an uh, eco uh, attraction or eco site. And I say yes, because in Balik Pulau, uh, there, were, uh, there, there are durian plantations, durian season, which is in May. Please come to Penang. And then uh, you also have, uh, you know, uh, uh, agriculture setting, village tourism, uh, food tourism, and you have uh, all the uh, horse riding and so on. And Balik Pulau is connected to uh, Ferengi stretch where you can find a butterfly farm, uh, the Oki and, and uh, Spice Garden and, and so on. But one thing is for sure uh, in, in Penang is that it is basically expanding on public-private uh, partnership. Many of the successful uh, attractions, ecotourism attraction, are run privately, uh, run like, like a business. And I think this is something that perhaps we want to explore uh, further in, in the near future. Uh, Penang learned that nature needs to be fairly priced, uh, but uh, modern amenity must be included to suit the demand of the uh, market that I mentioned before. So a uh, spice garden is, is a good example. Uh, uh, mind you, people are willing to pay, uh, not, not uh, at too high price, but people are willing to pay, Malaysian and non-Malaysian, they are willing to pay uh, to enjoy this. Kampung Agong is just a theme park of village, but it's always crowded because it cater, it understand uh, the needs of the new generation that uh, you know they want to visit a village, but they don't want to, you know, go through all the hustle of uh, going through the real village, but they want something that they want to take picture and uh, show it in the Facebook or Instagram or, or TikTok and, and so on. Uh, in, in Kedah, there is also what we call Pura uh, Village Glamping. So again, I mentioned about uh, not getting uh, their hands dirty. This is a good example. You know, suddenly you see glamping come into picture where camping used to be related to where you have money uh, related to getting hands dirty, no food, under the tree, very basic, and, and so on. So glamping come into picture. You go to uh, Kundasan, you will see glamping. You go to Pura village, Kedah, you know, the idea of glamping, bringing your, what you call, uh, comfort in, in the house into the eco setting. Uh, here and there, uh, in the master plan, we do touch uh, some of the potential eco site. Uh, Frog Hills, for example, but unfortunately, I don't believe uh, Frog Hill will be uh, sustained unless uh, the company develop around it and and it turn into uh, you know uh, equip it with uh, amenities and and try to attract uh, the younger or uh, mass mass tourists to come and and support this, or else it's just going to be uh, you know a passing example of. Uh, emerging eco-tourist site. Penanti, again, this is related to leadership. When when the leader of the place have the passion to uh, promote uh, what they call uh, festival, village festival, they organize it, and when the leader is not there, the whole idea, you know, gone to the drain. And similarly, Malindo Mangroves also uh, is another example that uh, site uh, potentially can be developed but uh, if we use the old model where you know the government came in develop it for you and uh, you know leave it to to grow i, I think that was uh, not not a very good 
uh, model anymore. My time is up. Uh, so the conclusion, the small conclusion that uh, you know that I can make uh, so far is that COVID nineteen has presented us an opportunity to relook at uh, how we manage things. But it seems you know everything we have forgotten about it. All back to business as usual. Uh, we do need a new approach. And Penang has learned. You know, you know, we talk about habitat, where the the, the Penang State Government has supported the Habitat Foundation to uh, to come up with their model. And uh, you know, uh, th there is no point of having uh, a green destination where you cannot sustain financially. You know, you, you need to sustain it financially. Then only you can talk about uh, saving the environment and and, and, and so on. Uh, the, the 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 thing that we learned from uh, the whole approach of uh, you know, making, for example, in the case of uh, us, uh, Penang Tourism Master Plan, uh, is that uh, in the first model where the, the top down, the government knows best and, you know, uh, uh, put everything in, in, in the document for us to follow, uh, did not really work. Then we come up with a bottom up approach where the local people uh, come up with uh, uh, suggestion and, and hope that uh, the uh, the whole uh, suggestion of projects can be materialized. I think the the Penang Tourism Master Plan we 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 took a, a hybrid approach of um, getting buy-ins yeah, uh, from especially uh, learning from the Penang political ecosystem that you need to get the buy-in from the state government, the ESCO uh, members, the Adun, and and the the, the local leader. Then you you bring in the ideas, you bring in the local people, you bring NGO and tourists come into the picture. Uh, we did uh, a, a, a nice uh, few workshops with the chief minister, with the state leadership, with the ESCO member, with the adults, and let them buy, uh, you know, our ideas and let them bring their ideas to to the plan. Then, inshallah, I think with with that setting, uh, uh. uh a plan can be uh, what we call materialized, and perhaps this is something that we can bring into the the next eco tourism master plan. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Prof Bada, uh, for giving us a good uh, insight of uh, where we are in, in Northern Peninsula and also in Penang, and also how the uh, tourism master plan is is being used to actually move uh, uh, eco tourism. So, uh, so we have heard from our three panelists today. So I have a few questions uh, before I open the floor for anyone to, to, to respond. Uh, Prof. Abran is still here as well. So he is able to also respond here uh, for any of these questions. Uh, I think the first one, let me start off with, uh, with Timothy. Um, I think, uh, Timothy, I'm, I'm going to put you on spot now uh, because you are representing Sabah as well. Uh, I know you do a lot of work in, in, in Sukau, in Sandakan. Uh, but if you see uh, what's happening in, in Sabah uh, of late, uh, there has been a lot of uh, uh, development that is taking place uh, uh, even at the at the marine parks. One case point is like, if you look at Tukar Brahman uh, Marine Park, uh, there's uh, a lot more uh, villas are being built there of late. So I, I see that a lot when I, when I read, I was, I was surprised about it at the, at the Madukan Island, uh, 40 or 40 or 50 villas are being built. So, uh, in your opinion, uh, since you are based there, uh, what is your view in in that sort of initiative, uh, being being built at a marine park? Is that going to, uh, end up, uh, just like what Prof Bada say in some part of Langkawi where it has become uh, too many tourists coming and destroying the very very place that uh, uh that you want to protect? So, what what's your own thought based on your own experience in how you manage? Uh, Sukau. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Vic. Uh, we are all dealing with the realities that uh, the world is quite messy, and what perhaps was once ecotourism or an ecotourism site will, over time, depending on the market and the audience that it attracts, change. And in case in point, places like the Tunku Abdul Rahman Park or even Kinabalu Park, to a large degree, if uh, you know. What was once an ecotourism natural, uh, very natural location has over time because of degradation of overcapacity uh, to mass tourism 
And the reality is the tourists need to go somewhere. I mean, you're getting all the direct flights from Korea or from China. They have to go somewhere and they would tend to go to places that are very accessible first. And the reality is we have to be, in a sense, allow them to go into those zones so that they do not then spill over into other areas that are even Oh, we've, we've lost Timothy again. Timothy? Yeah, I think we lost him again. Oh. There are also vested okay. interests at stake. Yeah. So I that's my personal opinion. And um and how we deal with it is we just adapt and we move our tourists who are eco-tourists away from those locations into other areas that are more pristine, uh, which means that we have to keep innovating, keep looking for new areas. Uh, because the reality is uh eco-tourism is you, you cannot make a trade-off with the too much volume. You have to say there is a limit to it. So that's my opinion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh uh, I know that's a challenge that we always trying to, to to fight. We trying to find the right balance, the right business model as well to sustain the place. Uh, but again, quality versus quantity. So that comes into the picture again. And how do you manage that? So that's always a, a challenge. So in terms of Sukau itself, uh, uh, I see uh, during the period of COVID, uh, how did you manage to adapt or uh, the challenges posed by COVID with less number of tourists coming or maybe even more coming in, 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 a, in a location like Suka where they want to stay away from the other tourists. How do you manage to sustain yourself during that period? Yeah, um, thanks for the question. And it's one that COVID is not an isolation. I think Sabah has had endured numerous shock over the years. There the financial crisis. We had the haze. We had hand, foot and mouth disease and SARS and kidnapping and tanduo terrorism um and as businesses and organizations especially when you do ecotourism you have to be very resilient which means that you actually have you have a, a, quite a bit of cash reserves at hand so that when some, this sort of crisis happen you can take certain steps that so for example what we did was we chose not to sacrifice the staff while uh, many of the staff went on some of the staff went on unpaid leave many of the staff were retained to upkeep the lodge but of course it's hard that's the reality because you're paying salaries there is zero revenue coming in um but at the same time the only thing holding you is your cash reserves and just staying optimistic that people will always value coming back to nature to doing ecotourism um you just have to endure those moments yeah okay thank you thank you so much timothy um uh, uh miss justin uh, i want to uh it's offshoot from uh, the question that I asked uh, uh, Timothy just now uh, uh, in terms of the development that is taking place in uh, conserved areas. So looking at the looking at the to the future, what are some of the key priorities that the, the Habitat Foundation uh, in further developing a sustainable tourism platform and also at the same time making sure that you find the right balance between development, yes, you can do development to what extent. So how can the role of uh, of this platform, how can you use, we use this platform to manage this more effectively? Mm, okay, so this is really, this is interesting because like, so at the, at the fundamental level, uh, we must understand, there's a lot of people who look at tourism as a destroyer of worlds. And in actual fact, uh, the, 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 result, the reality is quite the opposite, right? Where tourism exists, there is a justification to preserve uh, protected areas and important nature gateways because that provides a justification for that, right? So we just need to start doing that better, right? The same thing can be said for communities. Where communities exist, forests exist. And so we must uh, use tourism to strategically uh, add value to the notion of keeping our heritage nature as well as cultural sites intact and so that's all that okay everything everybody needs to upscale right uh, whether it's the point of view of tourists being more educated government being more educated uh and and uh, consumers no tourism providers constantly raising their game right within their means 
Um, then everything can change with the addition of resources and support, right? With increased knowledge and understanding what the global market wants and the standards they have set. That's where perhaps should be, that's where government support should be going, right? Ensuring that we have good sewage systems in islands and fragile areas, right? Uh, Prof Amran and myself, we are fundamentally conservationists at heart. We are both uh, at commission members of the IUCN World Commission on Protected Areas, right? And we see very much uh, exactly, I'm going to repeat what Prof. Amran said, that uh, the definition of a well-managed protected area according to the management effectiveness tracking tools that we use as our Bible involves ensuring benefits to local people, involves working with stakeholders outside protected areas to secure these areas, uh, it involves trying to improve economic uh, and uh, social uh, baselines as well. Those are actually on the list of to do's of any good protected area. So you mentioned earlier that uh, it was mentioned that we are involved in helping to introduce uh, professional management of the new Al Sultan Abdullah Taika Reserve, which is a wonderful privilege. Here is a freshly minted new protected area. And I'm so grateful uh, the foundation team is assisting the Mpahang Parks, also a, a relatively new protected area organization in getting its values right, right? So we are pursuing uh, the right kind of uh, frameworks for interacting with local communities, prioritizing with access and benefit sharing in terms of resource management, and also ecotourism and development. So this is an emerging area. Uh, and so we hope to invigorate that whole area, which actually is uh, one of those important ecotourism clusters in the NEP. So even though the, the ecotourism plan is now coming to the end of its tenure in a way, we, I, we still use it. All of that information is incredibly useful, uh, but we must go further than that, right? So uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think that's probably my answer. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. uh, Justin. Mm. Uh, Prof. Bada, uh, I, I know you, you, you were, uh, I can say, the architect of the, the Penang Tourism Master Plan. Uh, that we have currently. Uh, so we'll, can you elaborate uh, the in terms of the key objectives of the, the Penang Tourism Master Plan trying to tackle ecotourism? Um, how do you align that with the, uh, with the broader goals of sustainable tourism in Penang? Um, I know there's, that there are parts of ecotourism, but the, the, the bigger part of uh, the master plan is not really ecotourism. But, but I know this is an important part of... Uh, of the Northern Peninsula and also Penang. So how do you tackle this in your Penang Tourism Master Plan? Thank you, thank you, Rick. Uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, you're right that ecotourism is only a small subset of, you know, of, of the bigger plan. We have about 113 what we call initiatives. Um, uh, you know, some saw this as, uh, you know, project-oriented uh, uh, plan, but then when we were tasked to produce this plan. Uh, you know, the state government asked us to produce something that is workable, uh, which is uh, workable, reasonable, uh, practical, uh, and, and non-theoretical. So this is where you know we have to make sure also at the same time it must be sustainable, uh, if possible, uh, self-run or uh, sustainable economically. Uh, so this is something that uh, we want to, to, to work on. Now, we, we have seen around uh, from Perlis, for example, Gua Kalam, Penyer, Padu, <laughs> the one that has been you know, developed uh, in those days, and, and uh, what do you call Pulau Bayar. Uh, it, it's all, you know, discussion. At the same time, uh, we, we in Penang also realized that the pressure of uh, development is very strong. You know, you cannot deny that. You know, you, suddenly you can have uh, one island appear, uh, you know, overnight. And we have to understand that, you know, you, you cannot be so sentimental about it, you know, try to fight with the, uh, uh, the, the, the position, then uh, what we do is that we engage them. So, uh, you know, for, for us in Penang, I, I think if we can educate the politician, if we can educate the politician to be green, not be green, I mean, to be, uh, uh, you know, to, to love conservation, to love the green, to understand, you know, the beauty of heritage and so on. I, I think we are, will be in, 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 in a good sense. Because economic interest will come and, uh, you know, uh, try to uh, get their way in. I, I think Habitat, you are in Penang Hills, 
you know there are so many plans coming uh cable cars lah whatever lah throwong lah whatever so so we have to uh manage it uh carefully so we uh, to answer your question sustainable is still under uh is the underlying but then uh the definition of sustainability is is more widened uh engagement uh, involvement of the local people yes this must be uh you know involvement by the local people owned by the local people that's why they encourage a lot of small small uh, pockets of eco tourism attractions pri uh, privately run uh, so that the government you know do not really have to you know through their uh fund everything to to make sure everything so uh, this is perhaps uh, the things to go is it's not perfect it's not perfect but you know uh, it's a work in progress okay thank you papada uh maybe i'll just throw some question uh uh, from the, the floor and any of the panelists uh, can respond even even prof amran if you if you want to uh, to give your opinion you can as well uh, so there's one question here on uh, service quality on ecotourism service quality dimension on its impact on tourist satisfaction and ultimately creating their revisit intention what additional elements uh, may be required in your opinion in order to improve the strength of uh, this relationship when you talk about ecotourism in relation to ecotourism, what is missing or what needs to be enhanced uh, uh, when you look at the, the five uh, uh, service quality uh, dimensions? Uh, it sounds like a thesis uh, to me, but <laughs> uh, I think I'll let Timothy, you are in the uh, tourism business or Justin, uh, uh, to give your thought on, on this. Wow. Service quality. So yeah. Service quality, I think he put here assurance, empathy, responsiveness, reliability, and tangibility. Yeah. Um, I mean, you you only need to look as far as uh, trip advisor to understand how those five or six dimensions come into play. As as I you correctly pointed out, they are absolutely imperative. And the weakness of Malaysian, uh, a lot of Malaysian businesses is they don't care. You know, you just can't. If you want to come, you just put up with it, you know. And unfortunately... Uh, that kind of mindset really needs to change if we are ever to progress um, to a very uh, very advanced kind of level of tourism delivery. Um, yeah, so there has to be a change of a, a, a bit more of a growth mindset that, that all the players have to take, that they have to improve. Oftentimes, you see when they get a critique or a, a negative feedback, they tend to react very negatively or defensively. Um, and it... it it's also it's rooted in our culture of not taking feedback well. Um, so that, that has to change. Um, and uh, from, from our experience uh, running a tour company, when you do it well, the rewards are there. When people see there is a genuine effort to listen, to hear uh, feedback and complaints uh, and take it positively, people read that very positively and the customers come. Thank you. Uh, Justin, just can I give one minute of comment? Uh, not not yeah, not yeah. on Timothy, but on the classic case of Langkawi. You know, now I, I think in the news that Langkawi is suffering. Why yes. people uh why people go to Hanya and not Langkawi? And yesterday KTM uh, announced that they're going to have a uh you know to 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 put a salt on the wound. KTM hmm. announced that there is that is a train uh, straight to to Langkawi, but this is related to service quality and product quality. You know, you know, we we all as tourists, you know, it's our money. Uh, we decide where to go, and we will go to the best place that offer us uh, value for 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 our money. If if you if the local people do not sorry for people if you are coming from Langkawi, if you don't treat us well, if you you know the story of uh, siakap two hundred fifty ringgit siakap at one time, and then uh, you know things like that, how can people? How can you get repeat this uh, repeat visitation? That's answer your theoretical framework. Yeah. Yeah? That yeah. you know you have to deliver. Thank you. Yeah. So should I just chime in? Yes. <laughs> no. I mean the thing is actually the reality is tourists are not they're not from another another planet. They're just like us, right? We we want to be treated uh with um what's really big for me is sincerity. 
And sincerity goes both ways, right? Sincerity means you genuinely welcome people and you're genuinely proud of what you're showcasing, right? It's not just a job to you. And that's why local ownership of tourism is so fundamental, right? And actually, I would argue that the whole of Malaysia has this job. You know, in, in the tourism productivity nexus, which I'm a, a part of, we have this idea of Sayangi Malaysia, right? Rohizam, I mentioned it. Okay, so Sayangi Malaysia is about being really proud of your country. Uh, and anyone who knows me that I, I'm a totally uh, sentimental, card-carrying Malaysian, right? Because I think that everybody needs to be knowledgeable about their country. They need to go far and wide and cross over and up and down. They need to travel and learn about it. And then they need to be good ambassadors of it. And when we travel in our country, we would like the people that we are meeting who are, uh, who are curating those tourism experiences to feel the same way and would be really interested in helping us understand that. So that there is a very strong, okay, so language is huge. Language skills are, is where for, uh, tourism is falling apart in this country, right? So uh, that definitely needs help. But the other thing is information, education, and the ability to uh, convey, right? The, I, one of the fundamentals of ecotourism is you must learn something, right? Yes. Whether it's about trees or whether it's about yes. history or culture, you must come away with learning something. And that's where we generally, uh, we treat it as uh, nice to have. We don't treat it as fundamental uh, so there's so in terms of room for improvement uh, that would be one where we could make significant gains yeah thank you justin mm -hmm. one one last question from me here is uh, it's coming also from uh, one of the participants should mandatory accreditation of ecotourism uh, attraction be incorporated in ecotourism development now that we talk, we're talking about uh, NEP 3.0, uh, should this be part of it where it has to be a mandatory accreditation before you can even operate? Do you think that is a way forward or do you think that it's not going to help? I'll give my thoughts on it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oftentimes, the power of accreditation is in the process of doing the accreditation. If you believe in the process and you adhere to it and you, you begin to use it as a benchmark or a way to prompt the team or your, your organization to do those things, it becomes positive. If it is just a checkbox exercise, taking off things and putting out a nice badge saying, hey, we are Travel Life and we're Green Globe, it doesn't matter at all. GSTC, it really doesn't matter. In fact, it becomes uh, counter uh, helpful because people begin to distrust badges, certifications, accreditation. It becomes a meme. It becomes a yeah, so what? Uh, rather than being something to be proud of, it's suddenly we are a bit ashamed to have done it. So I think when you make it mandatory, you turn it from something that could be good to something that yeah. is bad. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Vic? Yes, but us. It's just, it just a halal certification. <laughs> uh, we have tried this before, uh, you know, for about four or five years. It, it, the process is quite uh, taxing, it's quite difficult. I think in the modern era, we have trick advisor. Uh, you know, we have other means of uh, where people who, you know, some, some did, some don't, uh, you know, put their own effort to rate uh, certain aspect of an attraction. And I think this is, you know, good enough. Uh, it's very dynamic, believable if, if the number is big. Uh, so I think, uh, yes, to, to answer certification is, 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 is crucial. But uh, informal certification like trade advisor, and sometimes you can, you can see hotel also put in a booking.com rating of eight. If, if they're rating 6.8, they will not put that there on, on their desk, definitely. But, uh, you know, it's there, and I think it, it's very important. Thank you. Mm. I, I would only say that, uh, that I think, never mind about the elite certifications, but we do need mandatory basics, right? So there's like things like Matex and all that, where the place must be safe. It must be free of lipas, from lipas especially. And it must have decent toilets and sewage and some of the basics. It must have good employee security. These things should not even be asked, right? But there are government agencies who are supposed to make sure that they check these things. Uh, and uh, we hope that they do their jobs, lah. Right, so the rest of it, definitely TripAdvisor and the very vocal social media crew will tell you whether you're doing a good job or not. Okay. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the discussion. There's a lot of questions as well uh, in the chat. 
which I will send to you. Uh, we we do have our, our guest speaker, Dr. Delphine, already uh, uh, online. So we are on track with the time now. So once again, thank you to our, our three panelists today uh, who uh, have given us great input uh, that we need to consider uh, when we are working on the uh, NEP 3.0, if it does take place. So, so we hope for the best for that. Uh, but I really am uh, very appreciative of the discussion today. We will try to note down, I'll try to uh, document some of the discussion today to see how we can move forward. So once again, thank you, Timothy, uh, Bada, and also Justin uh, for the great session today. Okay, so we move on to our, this, we have no time for a refreshment break. You can go in and out wherever you are. Uh, so, but we will continue our discussion today. So we have our guest speaker today, uh, Dr. Delphine Malaret King, uh, who's an advisor with the, the long run in UK, but I, I believe she's uh, in Kenya now. So I know that's why the, the time difference was a, was a challenge for us. So her uh, discussion today is the potential of, uh, of ecotourism for sustainable development, uh, giving us a, a global perspective. I know you, you've been to, to Malaysia and you're quite aware uh, what is the state over here. And it's good to get a global uh, perspective from you as we start looking at whether we need to rework on our national ecotourism plan uh, that is coming to a, a closure next year. So over to you, Dr. Dr. King. You can unmute yourself. Yeah, okay. Oh, thank you, <laughs> Professor. Um, I might. I have a presentation, so I might need. Uh, okay. You can to share. To share it. Yeah. Um, you see the icon at the bottom. You can share it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I can share it already. Okay. Um, just share the button, and then it will. It will point you to the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just looking where it is in that. Okay. Um... All right. Okay. Yes. Okay, we see. Um... Do you see that? Yes. Oh. Sorry. So I'm not claiming I'm an expert. Whoops. Uh, I'm not claiming I'm an expert in ecotourism in Malaysia, by the way. Um, but I, it was quite a vast topic, to be honest. So I decided to. Sorry. Do you have the toolbar in the middle, or no? I don't know why it's. Um, so I decided to really share examples, uh, leading examples of sustainable kind of ecotourism, drawing from the long run, which I've been the doctor, you know, I was the director of for many years, uh, examples that I know well, and trying to um, get some lessons from, from what uh, some of the members do, but also looking in to destinations that have been successful have at driving an economy around ecotourism and looking at what is it that they're doing that might be useful uh, for us to learn so let's see if um what, wait a minute okay so I always start, and I'm sure you've had that discussion before, so I'm sorry because I arrived late. It's very early in Kenya. It's just uh, getting light. Um, so I just, you know, what, what Justin, picking up from what Justin was saying, you know, we, we're hoping that we do the basic, but I think we, we have to do more than the basic nowadays. Uh, if we want to have a sector in a few years. So, you know, sustainability and positive impact is not a nice to have anymore. We're really at a time where we need to push the boundaries. And what are the boundaries that we need to push? You know, status quo in, in, in any sector is not viable. Oops. Uh, tourism has been seen as a as a vehicle for sustainable development for a long time because of its direct link with nature. Um, and, and if we look back at the definition of sustainability and sustainable development, it's really about people safely coexisting on Earth over a long time frame. And to do that, um, tourism has had some 
uh, good, you know, there's been some good practice and some bad practice. So tourism has a, a negative impact. We know, you know, the travel is is one of the is one of the uh, elephants in the room that one has to address, whether it's ecotourism, sustainable tourism, responsible tourism, however we call it. Um, but there's been a lot of examples of over tourism, you know, cultural erosion due to due, due to tourism. But then on the other hand, there's incredible power in tourism to drive sustainable development and to have positive impact on local area and, and regions. So tourism is a huge employer. And through tourism, we fund, uh, you know, conservation, uh, uh, cultural preservation. And the exciting thing is that there's a, a, an increasing demand for the right tourism, for nature based tourism, for ecotourism. And this um, this was already starting before COVID, but during COVID, there's been that philosophical reflection. Uh, people have um, had time to think, had time to, were forced. <laughs> A lot of people were forced to enjoy nature. Some of them had never really looked at it. Um, but also this reflection on, you know, the, the negative impact of tourism through through transport, through flights, and this um and the flight chain that has been, uh, you know, and flight chain. So the demand for sustainability, the demand for local spend, the de demand for local impact has increased. And I think also this idea of, um, you know, guilt-free, uh, a guilt-free trip. So ecotourism has the a, a beautiful uh, power to drive sustainable development. It's, you know, its definition is about sustainable development. So it embeds the principles of sustainability. The idea is to support conservation through traveling, um, to generate revenue and, and well-being for communities, to pro promote empowerment through education, again, like picking up from what you were saying, um, and um, also uh, the the preservation of cultural heritage. For me, you know, whatever happens, people are going to travel. So what we have to offer is a way, you know, they want to travel with more impact. They want to travel with more purpose. And we have to provide that. We provide, we have to provide access to experiences that that can be impactful and and that can provide um and that, and that help the the host country but also one thing about traveling that i feel is important to keep in mind is that it open minds and it transforms it's a it, you know it's a very used term but it connects people to places that may may not uh, you know, have thought about before. And I'm not only talking about international uh, travelers here, I'm also natural, uh, national travelers, regional travelers who discover parts of their country that they perhaps never have been and that connects them to, to another dimension of their country, another part of the culture, another part of nature. And what they do is then they take Hopefully, if we curate activities and 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 provide that education, um, they take away some 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 things that they can implement at home, and that can change behavior. It's not always the case, but this is often what ecotourism tries to do. So I wanted to show just a few examples, uh, not not all from the long run, quite from the long run, just to to show the kind of the kind of impact that sustainable tourism can have, um, and and ecotourism can have uh, in in different circumstances. So I don't know if any of you know the Maasai Mara in Kenya, it's a place of great migration. Um, and there, there's a national park. So I'm not talking necessarily here of the national park, but of all the conservancies that have been created to 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 um, to increase connectivity in the landscape and expand the 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 space for wildlife to migrate. And through these conservancies, so the conservancies are. Um, landowners pulling together, uh, creating a protected area, if you if you will, and most of them have partnered with um, tourism tourism um, businesses, 
Um, and what happens is it's created, you know, 142,000 hectares of increased conservation adjacent to, to the to the national park. There's more than 16,000 indigenous landowner that benefit from that tourism, you know, from ecotourism in, in this area. And through the ecotourism, through the tourism that the wildlife based tourism there, um, a huge impact on education, health and enterprise development, understanding that in Kenya, um, you know, the, 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 um, uh, government capacity to finance infrastructure, social infra infrastructure is quite low. So the tourism has taken, you know, has taken um, a bit of that over and has had huge impacts on the, on the uh, especially education of people. And the idea here was to create a land use that, a competitive land use uh, in competition to agriculture. So as you know, a lot of uh, uh, environmental degradation from comes from land uh, fragmentation, from habitat fragmentation. So the idea here is that tourism provides a competitive land use to agriculture. And that's what it does marginally. Um, taking, you know, another part of Africa, Volvidence, which is, um, it's a conservancy and this is one, one tourism operation. Um, with 13 farms, well, yeah, a, a, a lodge with 13 farms coming together, again, a, a pulling together to create the scale. And through ecotourism, um, it manages to, to protect 200,000 hectares of Namib desert. This is huge, well, this is huge scale uh, for, for, for private business to, to support. Um, one of the, the feature that I was particularly uh, interested in in Volvidens is this commitment to revive, um, to a program that revives uh, rural communities around, um, around the, the, the tourism property. So the nearest community is 180 kilometers away. And this property, you know, through tourism is trying to create a, an an economy around around the desert, the desert economy, stimulating um, local enterprise to serve the several lodges that are in this vast landscape. And I think again, this is the you know the willingness and the commitment to embed uh, the tourism in the local in the local economy and to create an economy around uh, around uh, conservation. Uh, again, picking up to, with what you were saying uh, before, creating a pride of the um, uh, about natural heritage, which in Africa, uh, you know, sometimes needs reviving. Uh, another example, and this will be an example that I look at at the national level, is in Costa Rica, um, a little operation called La Parias, which had e extreme, um, huge impact in Costa Rica. Uh, as you know, relatively small in Africa terms, but thousand acres of um, primary forest, and with a really strong ethos when it was uh, when it was created, um, which is no matter how how you cut it, a rainforest left standing is worth more. And, and I think living by this ethos created huge impact at the community level, at the conservation level, and was the first property to create an easement on 900 acres of, of, um, of forest. So I don't know if you're all familiar with easements, but the idea there is to create a, um, a covenant on the land title so that the land cannot be developed for anything else. Uh, but cons conservation, so they're very small develop development rights. Uh, Pantamal, so again, same story through tourism, their um, a property created a, a wildlife-based economy in the Pantamal in Brazil, which is the vastest floodplain in, in the world. So again, using tourism to show, uh, uh, to show the potential of an economy that's not extractive, an economy that's nature-based, uh, and which has 
uh, had incredible impacts with neighbors. It took many years, but um, the landowner managed to convince other, other landowners to, to look at wildlife in a different perspective. So a lot of people were killing jaguars. And after uh, um, uh, Kaiman's proving that actually there's an economy around jaguars, this has created huge space for the species. And again, an example there, a marine, uh, a marine example, because I thought Malaysia has a lot of marine areas. So, you know, what you do in the forest, you can do, and in the land, you can do in the marine areas. So what I, you know, celebrating the cultural heritage, this is a, um, this is an important part of ecotourism. This is about reconnecting people with their cultural and natural heritage. And, and that can come in very different forms. It can, you know, there's examples there where it can be about capturing, you know, capturing traditional knowledge. It's about celebrating um, natural heritage of an area. Uh, one, of, one of the members, Long Run members, has created a, a florilegium, which is a like a museum of botanical art. Um, another member was capturing the sounds of Samburu and, and creating an experience for, for guests um, to experience the, the you know, traditional songs and traditional sounds of, of the Samburu tribe. Um, and in Chile, uh, one of the members was um, using magical being legends to... to raise awareness about the forest, to interest local people about the forest, but bringing in legends and stories uh, the communities. Um, the experiences that I created are immersive. So the idea, you know, I was, I was mentioning this earlier, uh, it's about curating experiences where you learn. Ecotourism is about that. And learning is an active, it, it's about, it's about actively immersing yourself in something that perhaps you've never immersed yourself. So a lot of activities, there's a multitude of activities, but this is something that really is key to think about. The guest journey uh, uh, when, when it, the, the travelers are going to a destination, how they get there, uh, how they travel within the the area, how do they connect with people, how do they connect in a in a um in an authentic way, even though they're, you know, the hundredth person, person that's traveling, how do you create that opportunity for exchange? And a lot of um, experience now is really about learning from each other. So learning about the nature, learning and not learning, learning a skill, beading with someone rather than just a passive way to look at, you know, um, at local people performing. What's, what I feel sets ecotourism apart is that inherent commitment to impact. I mean, it is part of the definition, but it's it brings people who have a certain mindset. Uh, it's about efficiency in terms of resource use. It's about a partnership, about collaboration. It's about having, you know, for it to be successful, it's about having a holistic perspective. And interestingly, you know, a more sustainable approach and that more uh, holistic perspective, which I'm going to drill down just now, um in in there was a, I've just looked at a study in Spain which showed that ecotourism suffered much less in Spain, uh, but in quite a, a few areas um suffered much less than traditional tourism during COVID because people went to nature for safety. Um so at scale, I'm just gonna take three examples that are very well known in the sustainable tourism and ecotourism scene and looking at Bhutan, Costa Rica and Slovenia, which is, a, you know, which is coming up as one of the greenest destinations and reflecting, you know, I was looking a bit at what they do and uh, reflecting on, on how, how uh, ecotourism is, um, is embedded in the economy and how it's managed. Um, there's a few things that seem to be a common thread. There's a strong intent for, you know, for ecotourism to contribute to sustainable development. And, and this intent is translated in a commitment, a political commitment to make that work. There's a clear vision, uh, there are clear goals, 
uh, about sustainable tourism, I mean, tourism, sustainable development and sustainability at a national level. Huge collaboration. So we're talking about collaboration at the policy level. Um, uh, you know, this is um, this commitment is translated in, into policy that are actually implemented through transdepartmental, you know, transdisciplinary uh, bodies. Huge conducive, obviously a conducive and enabling framework. That holistic approach, which is hugely important because this is what creates the consistency of what's happening on the ground and the consistency at the national level with that sustainability thread. Um, the enabling environment, I'm talking here also about infrastructure. So we promote ecotourism, but how do you know, how do we help people go, you know, to places in a in a sustainable way? How do we manage um, you know, how do we manage waste? How do we manage our energy use? How do we manage resources at a broader scale? Um, and then obviously, you know, the massive pillar, and I think that's the biggest, which I'll, I'll come back to, is that, in, well, I mean, it's all big, but but inclusive, this in inclusivity, this engagement, this empowerment of local people to be able to manage tourism uh, and to manage tourism in a way that they want to manage it. So uh, Costa Rica, I mean, is one of the biggest, oldest uh, ecotourism destination that has really put sustainability on the map as, a, um, as an economy, really. Um, so I won't go into the history of Costa Rica, but it's, it's, it's really fascinating, the choices that Costa Rica has made to, to for sustainability, for protecting its, uh, its natural forest after it was degraded and the policies that have been put in place for landowners to restore, to regenerate, which has been hugely efficient, effective. The vision of the country re embeds that sustainability and how tourism contributes to the development of the country. Uh, it's a huge earner, ecotourism, and, and generates 30% of the budget for, for protected areas, so a huge part of, of the conservation uh, conservation budget. Um, you know, it's designed to support rural communities. Um, I was talking about cross-sectoral tourism board, um, but I think that there's two or three things that are particularly remarkable here is the brand, a huge sustainability sustainability brand, a huge tourism brand. There's a huge of effort in marketing, but the marketing is substantiated by by um by policies and implementation so it's a strong claim and TripAdvisor will verify you know would would really uh, reinforce the implementation of that of that claim there is a national certification scheme and interesting and you'll see that in in Slovenia that has been the pillar uh of of building that sustainable tourism um Infrastructure, we're talking about renewable energy at, at the national level, you know, huge effort in waste recycling, because obviously, you know, people coming, uh, however we look at it, we, we do have impact, um, not always positive. So how is that managed when there's um, when there's volume? And education about sustainability has been actually mainstream in all um, in national education. So kids have a, a sustainability module throughout their education. And the national certification scheme has actually uh, been also a really important factor for tourism operators and the whole tourism sector to get to that level where we, you know, where the basics is, is, um, is satisfied. And I think, um, you know, coming back to certification, I think as Timothy was saying, certification, you know, as a tick boxing exercise is not, you know, is not that useful, or is it? Um, and, but usually they've been used, you know, and, and I know a bit of that national certification has really you been used to push the sector, to inspire, to motivate um, businesses to do better and, and, to, and to embody what uh, ecotourism is meant to be in Costa Rica. And a strong slogan, if you don't know it, Pura Vida, which is pure life. 
Um, Bhutan, which is also the uh, destination which has taken quite different uh, different approach. Well, uh, also huge. I mean, in the constitution, I think uh, sixty percent of the of the country must re uh, remain forested. So again, really embedded the grounds for an incredible ecotourism uh, to develop and 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 be part of a sustainable economy. Um, uh, an interesting measure of success, which is not uh, tourism numbers, which is not uh, financial, it's the happiness, the happiness index, I don't know if you've ever looked at it, which en englobes uh, many different aspects of, of social, uh, psychological, physical, uh, well being, safety, as well as the financial part of tourism, uh, of, of sorry, of, um, of life. So so another way perhaps that's embedded that holistic perspective in in the in the economy itself um but what it's based its whole uh eco, eco tourism is on very strict management of travelers so there's very strict uh, with regards to carrying capacity of of um areas um, the carrying capacity of cultural cultural places. There's time, you know, times that are not allowed for tourists to go, and uh, to try and keep that cultural integrity. Uh, there's a very strong management for all, you know, for most of the income to be a re um, tourism revenue to be retained locally. So people have to book through local tour operators. There's it's it's a very um, Top down for travelers uh, uh, approach in Bhutan. Um, the idea, I think, part of the idea of the developing that tourism economy was to to, to uh, become an alternative livelihood to farming, which was the main source of income, and um, and uh, which was going to get highly impacted by climate change. So there's. Again, there's a kind of intent there to increase climate resilience through tourism. Uh, the other thing that's no noted here is there's a sustainability development fee, which is a tax, a tourism tax. But Bhutan is the example where that um, tourism tax is actually dedicated to conservation and community development. So the whole of the, uh, the sustainability SDF is actually um, uh, uh, how do you say funds um, community development education infrastructure um, health uh, as well as as the parks and that's quite unique because a lot of a lot of um, tourism authorities take a tax but it's not necessarily um, um, uh, dedicated to funding specific projects. And the tax was very high. It's been, uh, I think it started at $60. It went to $250 before COVID. Now, in terms of now trying to revive tourism after COVID, I think the tax has been lowered a bit. And there's, um, and there's uh, an incentive for people to stay longer. If they stay longer, the tax is reduced. So using that sustainability, sustainability development fee to also incentivize a certain type of tourism. And finally, the involvement of communities um, really strong in the, in the decision making around tourism um, and, and in the... Well, and in the guest experience with huge development of homestays, farm stays um, uh, in Bhutan. Finally, Slovenia, so totally different, uh, you know, European, a different, different type of, of um, region. Uh, but also, I think, englobes some of the practices that are noted in, in Bhutan and in Costa Rica. And I think I won't repeat. So again, Bhutan, very strong branding, very strong marketing um, and substantiated by policies, commitment um, and activities on the ground. So Slovenia, again, I think it was, it was voted one of the strongest brands. It's, I feel Slovenia. Uh, but... What I liked here is uh, the green scheme for tourism in Slovenia um, and this idea that actually tourism was about 
local people, local people's needs and and wants. So it was it's been developed really in a consultative uh, with a, a strong consultative process. Um, encouraging people to to have a voice, to have a voice on how they want to engage with travellers, how they want to connect with travellers, what kind of tourism they want. And then the Green Scheme for Tourism in Slovenia has been a, a benchmark, so a certification scheme, as well as providing tools, resources, training. It's been a way to really build the capacity of tourism business to deliver that ecotourism that uh, everybody's dreamt. Um, again, very uh, interesting a curriculum, you know, sustainability curriculum has been introduced just like in Costa Rica from, uh, from young age to university. So what I feel is, you know, I hope what I want to take from these examples is that it, ecotourism doesn't stand alone. Ecotourism and, and sustainable tourism doesn't stand alone in the economy to drive sustainable development. Of course, it does at a local level, but it's supported by much broader uh, commitment, political commitment, uh, policy commitment, and and lobbying and and encouraging other departments, other um, other parts of the uh, other sectors to engage in what we want to deliver, what we want to. Um, what we want to provide to guests and what we want tourism to be for, for our economy. When we talk about a holistic approach, I'm pinching this from the long run, uh, and I know those who were <laughs> at the training in, in, um, in December know what I'm talking about. I think sustainability is quite hard to just, it's, it's a complex, it's in multidimensional, so framework, sometimes it's, it's embedded in a, in a national certification, or I mean, in a, you know, it follows the, the GSTC certification, but it helps think things through. And I think even at a, you know, in a national strategy, it's a useful framework to look at, to keep in mind, uh, to look at, are we thinking about, uh, are we thinking about all the elements uh, that will provide that ecotourism economy? And this is, uh, you know, about the natural, the natural environment, about protecting the natural environment, which is also me, you know, means uh, how are we more efficient with our the resource use? How do we, um, how do we go from you know linear linear economy to a circular economy? And that serves other sectors. That serves everyone. Um, it's about the communities. We talked a lot about community well-being, and here I want also to highlight employees. You know, how do people treat their employees? How you know they're the ambassadors uh, uh, also of a tourism operation. They're the people on which um, a tourism a tourism business relies on uh, for the business to be viable to embody the the values that it's trying to to um, to send out. Um, so it's about both, you know, that surrounding community or the, the local people, as well as Dr. Delphi, are you still there? We are not able to hear you. He got disconnected. Wait for her for a few minutes. She's trying to redial.
Dr. Delphine, are you back? Yeah, yeah. sorry. Okay. Last slide. <laughs> um, do you see that? Well, not uh, yet. Nope. Not yet. Um, screen. Share. Yeah, you see. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I was finished with that, but I think this is tools that can help think things through so that um so that everything is consistent. That if we want to deliver an ecotourism experience and if we want to have an ecotourism sector, um, it includes a lot of dimensions. And finally, for me, basically, at the heart of ecotourism is, is the people and uh, strengthening that engagement, strengthening, br uh, bringing people together. And that means, you know, helping, helping train, you know, providing tools. You know, the, the network is, an, is a hugely powerful tool to bring people together, to learn from each other. So that education um that people are able to to voice how they want uh, uh to participate in that economy and that they're given the tools to participate in that economy and then how you connect you know the type of experiences that 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 you create to connect travelers to this to to their host and to their natural and, and cultural heritage um and no one can do it alone. So it relies really on strong partnerships and collaboration to accelerate uh, the change and, and, and especially the scaling up best practice, especially uh, at the national level. So yeah, that's it. So I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, and I hope that was, that gave a bit of uh, perspective on what it can look like. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh... Dr. Delphine King for giving us a good uh, understanding of what is happening uh, outside of Malaysia. Uh, it's interesting to see uh, Costa Rica and, and also in Kenya and uh, how some of the best practice over there can be adapted uh, over here. Uh, Dr. King, I, I think when you, when you dialed in uh, towards the end, we were talking about on uh, ecotourism certification and accreditation. What is your own thoughts on, on this uh, based on your own experience uh, uh, working in, in Kenya? Because I know Costa Rica have been very strong in this certification yeah. uh, for many years and that model seemed to work there. But uh, we have seen in some places where it doesn't work. And in Malaysia, I think we've been talking about this for, for, for decades and it never really took off. So what is your own view on this? So uh, in Kenya and Costa Rica, because I know them a little both, it's created national pride. So the certification has helped create national pride in the mm. in in ecotourism. Um, the the ecotourism Kenya has been has been here for quite a long time. Uh, basically, all tourism operation will have that by you know will go for that at least and then go for an international certification if they want to go that path. In the long run, so um, uh, it, the long run has a certification and we harmed and hard a lot whether to develop a certification and how we saw it was a way again to raise the bar consistently, to get people to think, to get people to take time out. Um, it's a very encompassing. So it's 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 it will be broader than many than many certification because it has a very very strong uh, uh, conservation component. So I think and and again looking at uh, Slovenia, it seems that that has been quite a a very strong also unifying unifying uh, factor. So I don't know if it's the spirit in which is it's is created. Um, how it is implemented so first as a as a way to support businesses to you know to meet some 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 um basic standard but also 
uh, you know, they, I think they, I don't know the Slovenia one, but certainly Costa Rica and Kenya, you have bronze, you have silver, you have gold. So there's this, uh, this idea of continuous improvement, um, which I think motivates in some instances, businesses, you know, it motivates the team, the whole team works around, you know, that, um, that, uh, that goal. So I'm kind of, you know, like Timothy, I think it depends how you use it. And I think it's the how the national authority uses it, how it's designed, how it's implemented, because it's only yeah. as good as who implements it, but also how it's put put across, you know, is it something to help? You know, we're all behind this vision that we have for ecotourism and for sustainable development in Malaysia. Uh, let's all stand behind and let's all do better and let's, you know, let's help each other uh, uh, build our skills. Thank you. Thank Rather you, than there's an auditor every year coming to check, you know, an exam every year. We have one question here from the chat. Uh, what is the appropriate source of conservation funding for sustainable tourism? Uh, what is an appropriate source? I'm not sure that's quite vast. Um, but uh, for ecotourism, in you know, in the examples that I've shown, okay, so Bhutan has a very specific tax uh, tax on 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 tourists, and interestingly, yeah. quite a lot of um, quite a lot of uh, the properties that I mentioned from the long run have a levy. They they call it a conservation fee, a conservation, or a, some of them they have a four C's fee where you have 20% go to the um, management of the conservancy, 20% goes to community development. Um, some have, and we know with COVID how, you, you, know, you know, the, the tourism impact was very, uh, sorry, the tourism revenue was hugely impacted for, so, um, for these uh, properties and for some of the ecotourism areas was really hard then to fund the conservation, but actually most have also some um, charitable funding. Uh, especially for that scale. So I think it's something that I didn't talk, I had a slide about it, but I didn't I, I didn't know if we had time, but in terms of resilience, I think this is important. Like when you look at ecotourism and 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 properties, you know, small, small businesses to build that resilience within the model. Um, and I think what ecotourism gives as a as a potential is to have several activities. So looking at uh, you know diversifying activities and certainly for conservation diversity, diversifying funding sources. One of the things that was interesting during COVID is guests didn't come to Kenya. Kenya was shut, but a lot of guests uh, who had booked left their conservation fees. So they paid in advance their conservation fees for the properties to be able to run the conservation um, activities that they had to do. And I think that's something that you can do through tourism because you build that you build that um, uh, that network of people who care. Uh, and they were in, I think in three or four properties of the long run, actually is the guest funded the conservation activities of the property or part of the uh, conservation activities of the property so that they didn't stop. Okay, so I don't you. know if that answers the question. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I think uh, th that's something that we have to do over here as well. How do you fund, how do you stay resilient during a crisis? And, and COVID have actually really taught us a lot of things. How do we move forward? How do we stay relevant? And how do we uh, pivot uh, after this thing is over. So maybe a learning as we go and and, and ecotourism has been the focus uh, ever since uh, we have opened up. So everyone is going to eco destination. They want to be away, far away. It's, they feel safe. So all of a sudden, the number have increased over there. So thank you, uh, Dr. King. Uh, I'm also going to open the mic uh, now to anyone who want to uh, uh, directly ask uh, any question. So you are able to... Uh, Unmute yourself if you want to ask question to Dr. King. In fact, it's open even if you want to ask question to any of our panelists here, including Prof. Amran is still here. And if you think there are some questions that you want to directly ask, you are able to unmute yourself. We have about five minutes before we conclude the session today. It has been short but really good sessions. 
So anyone have want to ask question directly, you can unmute and post a question to any of our speakers today. Anyone? No? Hi, good, uh, good afternoon. Yes, please introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, this is Zarif here. Uh, I'm from uh, KL. Uh, I'm actually running a resort retreat in Janda Bay. Uh, and we're also part of the Resort Association of Janda Bay. Uh, and we're currently trying to develop a sustainable, I guess, master plan for Janda Bay in that sense, because um, Janda Bay, for those who might not know where that is it's uh, just near Genting, uh in Malaysia right it's kind of like the the gateway of urban area to the national parks uh, and uh, as of recently the last few years um, there's been a threat of turning Jandabai which is a kampung into a town uh, under a plan called JKK you know RKKK and also RTD, which is Rancangan Tempatan Daerah, which is a local development plan. And so uh, there were big protests happening uh, in 2019. And then the government decided to shelve the issue for a while because they didn't really have an answer. Because when they presented the proposal to the to the people, it was like they were playing Sim City. And you know they didn't take any consideration. They wanted to widen the road, largely like four lanes, and people were going to lose their lands and things like that. Uh, so I was just wondering, taking that that brief information that I shared, um, and this can go to anyone in the panel, uh, really. Um, what would you advise uh, us on the best strategies in moving forward? Taking note, we've also started engaging with communication with people like Justine as well and the Sustainable Tourism Malaysia group as well. Uh, so we're trying to do something. Uh, and likewise, we've, we've also got like a festival coming up actually as a way to highlight the issue there. But yeah, I just wanted to ask you guys, uh, anybody here, your thoughts about that. Okay, so anyone want to take that? Uh, if you see... Uh, uh... Uh, we do Thank have, you. we do have the uh, like what Prof Amran have mentioned, the national ecotourism plan, and then the, the bigger problem is how do you put this plan, bring it down, trickle it down to the state level, to the destination level, and then when you find the destination is doing something totally opposite of what the plan is saying, then you have a conflict. That's a problem. So how do we handle that? Uh, uh, so maybe maybe Prof Amran, since you are still uh, online now, uh, are you okay. able? Yes. Thank you. I was about to go offline. <laughs> anyway, it's a very interesting question. I think I met you before several weeks ago. I cannot answer on behalf of the plan making entity. I think it's the Plan Malaysia and uh, the local council, right? Bentong. And of course, they have their own way of doing special planning. But my own view is the whole of Gender Bay has been overdeveloped with resorts, big and small, and missing on ecotourism activities. I've not done much work there, but I've visited it uh, several times, especially before COVID. See, even the high-end uh, high, high -end glamping, I've stayed once, too much money to pay for, and... Uh, what do you do there? It's just that you, you know, stay inside the uh, the glamping, uh, the tents with aircon uh, blasting. And then we will try to limit ourselves in terms of doing activities. One, because there are not much. Number two is that since you pay a lot of money, you say, oh, let's stay, enjoy this and take photographs. So what it is doing it is, is that it is spend, uh, making tourists spend a lot of time staying inside the tents and uh, the amount of you know uh, carbon being dis being uh, discharged and you can consider that. But also, uh, it is not really 
uh, highlighting the vast potential for ecotourism activities that the local communities could uh, you know offer if it, if it were to be planned better. So I think I do not know what is the process of the plan making yet. If it's still under the um, what is called the public participation, maybe you can come up with an alternative view. Because my view is that if you can show that the locals can be, uh, you can increase, the, uh, upskill them, and they can offer uh, different types of ecotourism activities, and they can serve the, I don't know how many resorts there are now. I don't think there are many resorts that are offering in-house, you know, packages, activities. So they don't have- well, I heard there's up to 100 resorts yeah, up in Jandar by resorts. up to 200 even, they say. If you are then encouraging even the locals. I mean, there are many locals who are who, who are building their own resorts, right? And competing against the uh, people from outside who have bought over land and devel developing that. And I think the better way is that, you know, the locals know the place. They know all the fantastic areas where it can be developed and sold for ecotourism. And tourists don't want to stay for, you know, every day in their, in their tents or in their, in their chalets. If you look at the high-end glamping in uh, Cambodia, I've seen the, the one by the river floating. What they do is after breakfast, the tourists are taken to the uh, Elephant's Rehabilitation Center and they are involved in all sorts of uh, volunteer tourism activities. And they only come back uh, late in the evening or in the afternoon and where they can enjoy sunset, yeah, you know, dinner, so you 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 reduce the amount of uh, the air conditioning that you need, and then tourists feel that they can be involved in lots of conservation activities. Because for me, the beauty of uh, glamping is that it is not just staying in the camps, but also being involved in all sorts, uh, different types of uh, conservations. So I think an, an alternative view that is based on how locals can leverage on ecotourism might be something that was worth thinking but if it's too late this, the plan is out there <laughs> i'm afraid I have, I have no answer but i i can yeah sympathize with what you are you with your you know feeling now sorry it took too, too long to work no thank thank you thank can you I, for can that can i chime in um Interesting. absolutely I, I mean i would just like to hi sorry i'm coming over to stay at your place today i'm just finished packing okay um <laughs> i'm just gonna say that you know, this this gender bike situation is almost if, if we're not careful, it will be death by town, death by planning, right? Mm -hmm. it, it is contributing to the Disneyification of very valuable uh, sites. Oh, hello, Albert Joe. <laughs> Just signed on. <laughs> Long time no see. Okay, so I mean so but 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 very essential that this is where placemaking is so fundamental. In so many of our historic towns or where where there's such beautiful assets, they haven't properly been valued, right? So that you're getting, we, I mean, in gender bike, thanks to the ingenuity of the locals and, and just the, the wonderful setting, it is, there is a bit of a pasa malam situation here, right? <laughs> uh, it does need to get addressed. We do need to standardize good quality amenities, safety, access to roads and services, but there must be a way in which we can do so without killing off what was beautiful and charming and uh, spontaneously interesting about gender bike itself. And all of the different types of resorts, they all uh, occupy different niches and tiers uh, for different budgets. Um, but the core must be those essential areas that are fragile and delicate and do need special care. But when you all said and done, you've got a lovely layering of beautiful setting, biodiversity, rich area, culture, history, and uh, now a thriving arts community and an alternative sustainable living uh, vibe, which is starting to come up. And I think that their, their location in such a strategic part in Greater KL is really, really charming. So uh, I think that's definitely that's something that uh, Prof Vic and Prof Amran, yeah. you should get involved in. <laughs> Even yes. uh, volunteer yourselves to uh, help to write <laughs> this thing before it goes off the rails. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, there's a gender bike festival, as uh, Zarif has highlighted. Definitely everyone should go. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Justin. And uh, welcome, Albert, uh, for taking your time to come in today. Maybe you want to say a few words before we wrap up for today? Yes. Uh, thank you, 
Professor Big. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Delphine. Great presentation to uh, from all the speakers. Uh, I, I just want to uh, say something about uh, this uh, webinar, uh, just to uh, let Professor Amra know I have been using your NEP 2.0 <laughs> from 1.0 to 2.0. So you shouldn't be too disappointed that nobody used it. And uh, the fact that I got so many awards is partly due to your effort. It's, it's a real pity that not many people use that because it gives a very good layout to the strategies to adopt. And uh, the, the problem is we are too short-term thinking. It took me 33 years to get to where I am today. And uh, it's very slow process too when you work with community. You take a whole generation in Sukkot to change community. The community projects we engage in, after 10 years in Kulu Farm say I don't see much progress, but changing mindset is difficult. So. I, I hope that all the Malaysian who are listening in don't give up. Um, thank you. I just want to thank Amran. You've done a great job. And uh, all of us who are eco-warriors, keep going. It's a slow process. Uh, thank you, Delving. I know I've not been very active what you are doing, but I have learned so much about the 4C as well, what uh, a long run has done. So it's from many sources that I pick up all these great ideas. So uh, don't look for uh, fast return. It's a long process. It's a long road. That's why it's called a long run. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Albert. Thank you for taking your time to be here as well today. So once again, uh, thank you to everyone for an excellent session. Uh, I know it's only three hours, but I think we've discussed quite a bit. Uh, it's a good start uh, for for us to reflect on uh, our NEP 2.0 and moving to 3.0 if we do move. So this is the first start of the discussion. This is not going to be the last of this. We're going to have series of discussion moving forward. And we hope to work with uh, all the participants here uh, who are keen to work with this, uh, work with the uh, Malaysian Ecotourism Association. We can work together. Uh, I'm working very closely with Justin now as well. So hopefully we are able to develop something, a good framework that can take uh, the country to the next level. Uh, we have seen uh, how good the tourism plan. It's a solid document, but it's a pity that not everyone have fully uh, used it. Uh, and we don't want to be developing another one. I think that the current one is already good. It's just a matter of tweaking slightly to, to learn from the mistake from the, the second one and to see what else we can do to improve uh, for the third one. So we, are, we will stay connected. There are a lot of questions here asking me whether we can get the presentation slide. So if the speakers are able to share their slides, they can share to me, then I will ensure that the uh, the slides will be shared with all our participants uh, today. So with that, uh, I would like to thank once again, all our speakers uh, from Amran Hamza. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Dalfin Malaret King, uh, who came in, uh, even though it's you're in a totally different time zone, made it on time. Uh, Justin, thank you for, for, for sharing your, your, your plans for the sustainable tourism platform. And Timothy, I think you have really done an excellent job as well, uh, taking the cue from your, from your dad. So it's really good to see at least there's a follow through of what your dad is doing and, and moving forward with you now. And of course, welcoming back Prof Badaruddin and we are, we are hoping to engage a lot more with you. I'm also based at District College in Penang, which is very much close to Prof Bada. So we will... We will work together to 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 strengthen uh, uh, the, the expertise that is here to to ensure that we are able to move the industry uh, to the next level uh, that it should. So thank you, thank you, thank you, and we will you will hear from me more uh, for other events uh, soon. So once again, uh, thank you to everyone. I will see you all in the next session. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Uh,